nightmare.
Yo. We're just letting them roll in, baby. You like my new hair? It's the Slick Oily Man. It's the Slick Oily Man. Do you want to buy a car? Do you want to buy a little bit of gabagoo? I got the oily hair. Tony. Tony. I don't believe it. Tony. Call me Polly Walnuts. I do have a little bit of that gray on the side. So I'm growing my hair out. To be sexy Matthew McConaughey, man. But I realized on that long path, that long journey, there's a lot of long days and long nights of looking like a damn fool with horrible hair. So I said, how am I going to fix that? And I watched The Sopranos. And I said, I become an oily man. Dapper Dan man. Perhaps you are a fop man. Are you a fop man or a Dapper Dan man? Well, I went with fop. So I fopped it back. Like Polly Walnuts. So we're going to get used to oily, slimy, foppy hair. For the next eight damn months until it becomes full on lion's mane. I'm talking about. I'm talking about Matthew McConaughey, 2004. Lion's Mane. But you didn't tune in to hear about my hair journey. And you got that free of charge. Boom. You got a free update on what my hair is up to. How I got my hair did. How I gonna get my hair did. How my hair gonna be did. All of that free of charge right there. Look at that. You know what else you get free here? All kind of stuff. Look at this. Look at that. That was free right there. <laughs> I didn't even charge you for that. By the way, you can support the show if you want to with the Super Chat function. Super Chats are via Streamlabs. Thank you to all of our deft... Oh, man, I forgot to put the links in. Forgot to put the links in the chain. Chains around my neck by Big Tech keeping me a slavery let's get over here and put all the necessary links for all the nerds because i forgot to today i'm going to be talking about a few things that crack me up and we're going to have open forum we got a lot of nerds chad nerds and perhaps haters that have already poured into this little waiting room right here ready to talk smack ready to put me in my place ready to smack me down and you can already tell I'm fired up. I got that energy today. You can tell. You can tell it's just oozing out of me. And I still forgot to put the... Thank you. Jamie's bringing me coffee. That's sweet of you. Look at that. Bringing me a espressos. Espressos. I deserve an Escalade. That black atheist woman on Twitter got sassy. She said, who the... Is J. Daya? Who T.F. is he? Sister Soldier chill out, girl. Damn. She's about to debate Chase, by the way. Chase versus Sister Soldier coming up in the Creator Clash 2024. It's going to be like Andy Kaufman over here fighting women up, up, up in this place. Get ready for that 2024. Can you hear me? If you would, hit like and share. Well, I got that oily hair. I got that oily hair. Go ask you to hit that like and share. While I got that oily hair. Up in here. <laughs> I got that oily hair up in here. Gonna ask you hit that like and share. Ooh, 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 ooh. I don't even know what that was. That just came out of nowhere. That's the beauty of what we call improvisational arts. <sighs> and I even snorted for the hell of it. Why not? What are you going to do about it? You ain't going to do jack. Jack. I still forgot to put the dang Twitter space link in there. Now I got to find that. 
So yeah, so again, it's open for him today. You're going to get the uh, talk smack to me. Put me in my place. Expose me as a KGB sorcerer. Expose me as a uh, Panamanian CIA drug lord. Uh, all the above. Free of charge. No questions asked. Don't ask, don't tell policy. <laughs> Uh, I know a lot of you haters are un up under that no ask, don't ask, don't tell banner. You got that no, don't ask, don't tell uh, uh, umbrella above you. Umbrella, ella, eh, eh, eh. We found love in a hopeless place. We found love in a, huh, mm, eh. We found love in a hopeless place. That was stream of consciousness. See, we went from umbrella, ella, Ella, eh, eh. That's Rihanna. Rihanna is the correct Caribbean way to pronounce it without appropriating. Rihanna. -ha. And then we went to. We found love in a hopeless place. A lot of you are out there in a hopeless place right now. And today is the live stream where you will find love. I guarantee that. All right, I got the Twitter link for the haters. Haters. I'm going to put haters. Haters here. How's that? Haters go here and you can yell at me and put me in my place. Today, I don't care. I'm gonna expose me. Expose Dyer.com. And for all you dummies that uh, haven't figured this out, even though we've been doing it for like two years, it does not work on a PC. There's the link right there in the chat. You have to be on Twitter spaces on the app. On the APP. You down with APP? Yeah, you know me. I got the oily hair up in here. Hit it like a share. Streamlabs. You see that link? That's how you support via Super Chats. When I start singing and rapping, that's the only time the Super Chats come. Now, to answer the dumb questions that I get every freaking time I do a live stream, why are you guys such a long introduction? Why you play so much music? Because it's a live stream. It takes nerds 10 minutes to get the notifications and come in here. This makes money from live streams, dummy. Why your video so long? Because that's what makes money, dummy. I almost rhymed it. That's what makes that money, dummy. Acting a fool. I'm your dancing monkey on the stream. You throw the chips at me. And I do the dancing monkey dance. <laughs> like Matt Dillahunty over here. Monkey have intelligence because monkeys start to think. Therefore, logic. That's the literal Matt Dillahunty argument that his slow boy audience thinks was an actual argument. I'm not joking. It's what he said in the Jordan Peterson debate. But today we're not going to talk about that. We're going to be talking about a little bit of things and then we'll open it up to all the haters and the debaters. Uh, what do I want to talk about? So we just did a badass interview with Dr. Steve Turley. Uh, really happy to be on there. We've had mutual friends for many years. Shout out to Conrad, friends. I got to meet Conrad years ago down in Austin. One of my early trips to Austin back in the day. We met up a couple times, I think maybe once after that. I can't remember. Um, but, uh, you know, he converted orthodoxy many years ago. Good friend of Dr. Turley. So, Shout out to Conrad for setting that up. Much appreciated. And by the way, looking forward to seeing a lot of you people in Austin when we're at the live event, February 11th. Go get your tickets now. Do none of do y'all not want to come to this event? I don't understand. Did you? It's not just being dumb, dude. There's like five hours of stuff. There's one hour of being dumb. Four hours of fast boy material. One hour of slow boy material. That's the BG Cumbie hour. <laughs> Four hours of fast boy material. Me and Jamie going fast through intellectual issues of the day. <laughs> snort, snort. <clears throat> gang, gang. As Theodore Vaughn says. 
Theodotus Vaughn, Gang Gang. Theodotus Theodoratus Vaughn. That's a black dude's name on a white dude right there. Yes, we, by the way, some we have some people in the chat that have been to the live events. They're like a party, dude. About, but nobody's getting smashed. I don't care if you bring your alcohol and your little flask. Ooh, look at my little flask. Ooh, ooh, it's shaped like a little bugger man. It's a flask shaped like a little bugger man. And I'm going to sip my alcohol. Ooh. I don't care. Do it. Go ahead. You want to bring your... Bring your Flat, if you want to bring your bling and your flask, go ahead. I don't provide alcohol at the, the, the events because I don't drink, but I don't care if you drink. BYOB. Bring your own boomers. And we do not provide oxygen and tanks for the boomers that do show up because we always get about three or four. So you have to roll your oxygen tank from the casino to the live event if you do want to come. I'm just kidding, but that's a good segue into the Booms Day clock. I can't believe this stupid thing was back. Oh, Twitter. Also, I forgot to pull up. <clears throat> a lot of people don't know what this dumbass thing is, but I've been making fun of this thing for a long time. A long time. Because it's the stupidest thing ever. No, we don't, we don't want to go to that. Click on that pretty face right there. P click on that e-celebrity face. And then we come over here to, look at this stupid thing. Watch this. A lot of y'all don't know. So this is like a Rand Corporation scientism creation. Okay. And no, this is not a, uh, a comedy sketch. This is a real thing. <laughs> These, somebody said this was like PBS in 1995. That's exactly what it looks like. And why they got half of a clock. And why are they all standing frozen like a bunch of weirdos that have never been on camera or this is the first time they've ever had their picture taken, right? So this is a real thing. It's a dumb-ass Cold War propaganda thing that, I, if I recall, it goes back to, like, Rand Corporation and the, the Cold War. And it's like, oh, uh, I haven't, haven't pulled up. Here we go. i pull it up for you. Um, let's scare the crap out of all the boomers that they're going to get nuked with the doomsday clock. So I called it the boomsday clock. This actually inspired one of my first cringe core hits, which I will also play for you for your leisurely listening pleasures, because I know you want to hear it. Let me pull that up, get that one ready for you. Remember this, this was actually the first cringe core song, the first hit when we started make dropping hits, but check this out. This is real. I mean, it's a real, it's really fake. It's fake. It's totally fake and gray, but you got to watch this to believe it. Watch this. The members of the Science and Security Board move the hands of the doomsday clock forward, largely, though not exclusively. Well, it's like a God voice of a God, goddess woman. None of the people in the video are actually talking or moving. And <laughs> we've got uh, like little clone of Michio Kaku on the right. Michio Kaku! And then they got grandma on the right. And then they got boomer aunt, wine aunt. And then they got a uh, random dude with his, like our age dude, with his buttons buttoned up. And then we got grandpa on the end. And how, what is, is this, this, is this science? This is the, so, the, the diversity breakdown of the science community. Is that what it is? I mean, what it, the heck? Because of the mounting dangers in the war in Ukraine. And why are they all frozen and this woman talking over it? We move the clock forward the closest it has ever been to midnight. It is now 90 seconds to midnight. <laughs> why is it a fourth of a clock? Like you could put the whole clock. They used to do the whole clock. And by the way, those hands don't even move. And it's just a random scientism man moving the hand as they see fit. That's not even a real clock, dude. If you're going to count down the end of the world, at least make it a real clock. And then it's just silence. The weirdest, most awkward, fake real thing you've ever seen. That inspired this hit. Shout out to my peeps. Take me back to the Reagan era. 
Wall Street. The Bulls and Bears. Making moves. Buy and sell. Spread the word. Pacific nationalism. America. To the ends of the globe. America. To the black hole. Americanism. Boomer worldview. Boom. Boom. Boomer worldviews. Retired of Florida. Buy a van. Key Largo, Montego. The Boomsday Clock. It's about the Beach pop. Boys. Beach Boys. Key Largo, Montego. Mar a Lago. Shout out Mar a Lago. 401k. 401k's, baby. Reagan era. Casinkos. Crescinos. Lose your money at the Crescino. With an oxygen tank. Pawn the oxygen tank. Boomer town. Boomer, Boomer time. time. Turn the time. I messed up. Turn the time. <laughs> Turn the hands of time. On the Boomsday clock. You just saw the Boomsday clock. Back a notch. Talking about. Let's turn the hands of time on the Boomsday clock back a notch. Tell our friends here in the science community with their fake ass clock to turn the hands back a notch. Now, did y'all not realize I called all this? Look at that. I predicted the Boomsday clock. When did I put that up? 2015. That was the first cringe core hit. Shout out, put it on YouTube five years ago. I mean, on Twitter five years ago. It was on YouTube six or seven years ago. You're welcome. You're welcome, everybody. You're welcome for that. Uh, I did want to just mention a little bit before we move on to... Because I'm tired of hearing this stupid-ass question 50 times. When you gonna cover icons? When you gonna respond on icons? You mean the 20 times we've talked about it over the last five years? Like, why, if, if the arguments that are coming out about Gavin, Gavin, Dr. Gavin Ortland's arguments about this, if it's the same old arguments that have been rehashed, Why does there have to be a new response to some crap that's the same old crap that's been said for a long time? And I I played one of the clips the other day from it. And I thought it was funny because they were all like, oh, he just owned the Roman Catholics on this. That's my argument, dude. He got that argument from me. I'm talking about the argument that says that icons were a doctrinal development. Okay, well... The Roman Catholics that say that are wrong because the Seventh Council says it's not a development. It's an apostolic tradition. That was my argument against doctrinal development against Ibarra and multiple live streams. And Dr. Gave and Ortland just cribbed that argument from me. Anyway, let's look briefly at a couple of these points from this text here. Which, guess what? I got my document cam. Document cam. I don't know why I'm singing it like that. But look at this. Check this out. Boom, look at that. Document cam. What? Woo. That's the book. And somebody's going to say, Well, so what? The question was veneration. Well, we'll look at that real quick. So you'll notice that Dr. Hugh Weibrew, who is a Protestant scholar, notes that the sacrifice of the liturgy is mentioned in Hebrews 13. That's a point you've heard me mention many times. The Eucharistic rite 
comes out of the synagogue and temple liturgy, which we have covered many times. Go watch Lewis's documentary that he made on this. It is based on this book. Oh, we got the document cam. I can just look at that. I can just do that. Look at this. So damn fancy. See that? Lewis's documentary is based on that. Let me go back to the... Get my cams all mixed up. Look at that. Mm, fancy. If you would hit like and share. Chad nerds. And what do we read in Dr. Hugh Wybrew on the history of the liturgy? Well, he notes that everything that you've heard us been arguing for years... In this historical Protestant analysis of the history of the liturgy. Oh, it's early on. The Eucharist as a sacrifice. Uh-oh, 160 AD in Justin Martyr. Anybody who's read Justin Martyr would know that. And you'll notice above that it's a triadic offering and that it's eternally present. Christ's commemoration in the Eucharist is an eternal present reality admitted by this Protestant liturgist scholar. Page two. There were house churches and there was the Dura Europa Synagogue, which everybody, uh, you've all seen this, right, has icons. Now, first the discussion was, was there icons, right? And then it was, oh, but were they venerated? Okay, so first of all, let's establish, are there icons? Yes, there's images. Oh, but they're not venerated. Oh, really? What about the many statements of the relics of the martyrs being venerated? You understand the principle behind an icon is no different than the principle behind the veneration of relics. And anybody who's read anything in terms of the post-apostolic fathers, Ignatius, Irenaeus, Martyrdom Polycarp, Justin Martyr, the first and second century, knows that relics were a presence in the early church from the earliest days. Why? Because in the book of Acts, they took cloths from Paul's body and drove out devils and healed people. The bones of Elisha raised the dead. Relics is a biblical idea. Why? Because the relics are deified by the uncreated energies of the Logos. Because when he assumed human nature, he deified human nature by that assumption. And thus anyone connected to his deified human nature is also deified. Therefore, the bodies of the saints undergo the same deification. And thus they become living arcs, living holy things. They are living arcs of the covenant. The converted house churches in the first century are not Protestant strip malls. They're not guitar masses. They're not rock ceremonies and rock concerts. They are house churches converted into things with altars. Ooh, interesting. Why were icons not everywhere present in the first three centuries? Uh, duh, it was a period of intense persecution. Did no one figure this out? This is why the liturgy says, which goes back to prior to Constantine, the ancient liturgical rites say, I will not speak of thine enemies, to, I will not speak of thy mysteries to thine enemies. That's still in the liturgies. Why is that still in the liturgies? Because the church was in the catacombs, the church was hiding. So obviously there's not icons everywhere, dummies. This is a no-brainer. Who says that? Why brew the Protestant scholar says that? But guess what? Imagery is present in the 200s in the catacombs. What? See, then the then the the burden of then the 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 window shifts. Well, there might have been images, but they weren't venerated. Do you understand that the principle behind the Eucharist is the same as the principle behind the relics? And that's that incarnational principle. So, in other words, relics is the exact same argument as iconography. And the same Protestant heretics that won't reverence the relics of the saints don't do it for the same reason that they that we that they won't reverence the images. It's the same principle, proving the point that yeah, it's exactly the same principle, and that proves that your churches, by the way, don't have the deifying energies. Because if they did, you would have miracles and you would have the relics of the saints, and you don't. Therefore, you're not the ancient apostolic church. Clear, clear as day. So the irony is that all of Dr. Gave and Ortland's presentation undercuts everything that he thought he was proving in his 30 minutes or whatever it was. 
Icons in the 200s, early iconography. Prayers for the dead. Oh, what? So everything that we talked about is mentioned and vindicated in Hugh Wybrew's classic liturgical text. And it just shows that I don't know. I'm not, I'm surprised so many people are mystified. Oh, whoa. You understand that nothing that Dr. Gavin Ortland offered. Is anything different than was it that's been in every Protestant quote mine for several hundred years now? So people are mystified by like, oh, quote mine again, whoa. It's actually really weak. Because it's not just a matter of where is icon veneration explicitly in the first 300 years as a theological treatise mentioned by the church fathers. Do you mean to easily disprove that? So in other words, what's the presupposition of that line of argumentation? The presupposition is that we must find an explicit theological treatise in the church fathers outlining that very thing, or we don't have any reason to believe it from a patristic standpoint. Oh, you sure you want to go that route? Because where is the Protestant canon listed in terms of the Old and New Testament prior to St. Jerome? Oh, there's not one. So on your own grounds, you wouldn't believe in your own dumb canon. Do you see how lame and low IQ these arguments are? You're too mean. You're too mean. <laughs> I'm not mean. I'm just tired of hearing the same arguments that have been pushed for hundreds of years as if we haven't done countless podcasts and talks and videos about iconography we've done iconography podcasts with snack twice we've done one with pajot we've done my own pulling from the lost Spensky book we've gone into great depth about this topic from an old essay i wrote right here biblical defense of icons pointing out that i mean it's amazing that he didn't even think of the fact that the old testament and the new testament writings themselves are pre-patristic witnesses to iconographic veneration, to iconodulia. He didn't even think about that. What? Who? What? Here, I'll put it into the chat for you, boys and girls. Biblical defense of iconography. Joshua bowed before the ark of the Lord. Well, now, wait a minute. And when, and when we brought that up to multiple Protestants in the last couple of weeks, Israel prostrates before the ark and the temple and Solomon. They're not prostrating before the ark. They're just prostrating and the ark happened to be there. <laughs> oh, so it wasn't the bones of Elijah. It was God healing people and the bones of Elijah just happened to be there when the healing happened. I mean, how dumb is this, dude? Seriously. This is so stupid. It wasn't the cloths from Paul's body. It was the power of God that just happened to be there at the same time as they was blowing their nose with the handkerchief cloth. <laughs> really? Good one, dude. Yeah, you Protestants are solid. Smart. You guys are so smart. <laughs> so smart. How are we going to keep up with y'all? You see how right there the two strong arguments... Where's the patristic witness for this in the first four centuries? Where's the patristic witness for your canon in the first four centuries? Oh, there's not. Oh, oops. Did you hear that? You want me to slow down? Slow boys? Slow girls in the audience? Did you hear it? If the presupposition is that there needs to be specific explicit written patristic evidence and by the way on a protestant position says who why are we supposed to believe that on what grounds just like they do with you gotta follow saint jerome's canon uh why as a protestant am i supposed to follow saint jerome or any of them it's arbitrary likewise if the principle is your presupposition is that something has to be explicitly mentioned in a theological treatise to be believed or to think of it as part of praxis and worship 
then your own biblical canon Protestants should not be believed because it's not there until Jerome. Can you follow that? What are they going to do? Who quote mine? Spamming, machine gunning with a quote mine. That's all we got. Of course. Yeah, of course that's all you got. Haters, you can call in. Open forum. Look at this. We're about to go to some some of the open Q&A. Haters. Look at that. Who else, by the way, gives you the opportunity? By the way, that's what I'm saying. Horace in the chat. Right. Jamie Aiken was making that Newman argument of doctrinal development. The icons are an accretion that developed over time. Oh, look at my Star Wars figurine collection. I'm Jimmy Aiken. Oh, Nestorius is actually orthodox. I'm Jimmy Aiken. Oh. Why does anybody listen to that, that gigantic, spherical, gutted soy man? I mean, if people, by the way, just think about this. Somebody made it. Sneeko said this. Why are you listening to anybody fat? Why are you listening to anybody fat? Ibarra. Why are you listening to anybody fat? Because you have to add hominem. Not necessarily. Because those are the people that are always trying to morally one up. Okay. It would be an ad hominem if it was just about the issues. However, they all try to morally one up everybody. So I'm just going to say from the outset, if you want to have the moral one up, then you better have your public moral ducks in order. Meaning, if you're a big old fat dude, I don't believe that you keep the fasts or that you morally can control yourself. So don't come at me with all your moral superiority. He's too mean. Jay's too mean. Why is he calling me Bluto even though I look just like Bluto? That's mean. I'm Eric Barr, the greatest papal lawyer the world's ever seen. So look, uh, we don't have a problem making jokes. And by the way, all of these people who won't make public jokes or won't make jokes or do impressions or whatever, they always try to play like the, a Jay Dyer is just too mean. Uh, I'm Dr. Michael Easley, and I talk like this because it dupes really stupid people into thinking that I'm pious because I've got Moody Baptist Bible voice. Oh, uh, don't you believe I'm pious if I talk like this? Uh. I'm not like that. I'm just the real person. This is the real me. So if that's mean, then I guess I'm mean. But if you want a simple introduction to iconography as a theological principle, that it doesn't begin... With the New Testament. It's amazing to me that did these Protestants not realize that it doesn't begin with the New Testament? It begins in the Old Testament. Do you understand the temple, the ark, the images, the seraphim, cherubim everywhere? That's iconodulia. I'm pretty sure if reaching your hand out to touch the ark kills you, then the ark is a reverential thing. Does that seem like a logical argument? Uzzah? Huzzah! Do you even know what I'm talking about? When Uzzah reached out to touch the ark to stabilize it and he died? Well, that to me says that's a holy thing. The incarnational principle of things being holy is in the Old Testament. Do you understand? Therefore, it is not a Protestant accre or a, 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 a Constantine accretion. And all you got to do is read the post episode fathers to see this. It's not even that much to read. I got that Cyril. What is it, Cyril Richardson? You don't have to go read all these volumes of encyclopedia sets of the Church Fathers. Go read this book. Look at this. I've got a document can. That's so fancy. Here's an easy one. I'm pretty sure that's a Protestant too. I think Cyril Richardson is an Anglican. No, even, even better. He, even worse. Union Theological Seminary. That's like the worst of the Protestants. Rockefeller University. Look. 
early Christian fathers, you're going to find bishops, you're going to find relics, you're going to find uh, all the principles that you find in orthodoxy in this. So Gavin Ortland is relying on quote minds that are old school, tired old things that have been rehashed for for ages, dude. None of this is any anything new. I mean, it looks to me like, I don't know what his source material is, but I mean, it looks to me like Gavin Ortland is just uh, like doing what James White was doing 20 years ago. You go find James White quote minds. You can go, I got William Webster's whole set down there, which is just quote minds. And then there were Anglican dudes who were Calvinist Anglicans. And you can go all the way back to Calvin in the Institutes where Calvin was quote money. Okay, so there's nothing new to this. But I did want to make one last point on uh, originism because in the Weiber book, he mentions origin. He mentions originism. Because somebody says, Eusebius was against the images. Yeah, but Eusebius was a heretic. So the argument is not all the church fathers agree. Okay, that's not our position. There's periods where there's all kinds of debates. The reason I bring up originism is that, and yes, that's my little sock feets. That's my pretty little booties right there. See my sock feet? Look at that. Ah. People laughing at my sock feet. I got to wear sock feet because if I wear house shoes, my feet sweat. It turns into a clammy nightmare. Slipping and sliding everywhere. We don't want that. Anyway, Hugh Weiber says that by uh, in, in the, the modus op, the driving force of the iconoclasm in this period, the first, second, third century, and it, yeah, of course, it's people like Eusebius. They were influenced by origin. And when you go to the Seventh Council, if you read Meyendorf's book, Byzantine Theology, he's got an excellent chapter called Monks and Humanists. Which is vindicated, by the way, in the recent Senecio Glue book. He, he cites and vindicates Meyendorf many times in this book. Because the point is that, yes, it was the originist presuppositions that were driving the philosophical argumentation of the iconoclasts. In other words, it was heterodoxy. So the reason that Eusebius was semi-Aryan was also because of his originism. And the argumentation at the Seventh Council about icons is what are the icons picking out? The iconoclast said, because of divine simplicity, via origin, via Plotinian simplicity, you can't depict what is uncircumscribable. How can you circumscribe the divine nature which is uncircumscribable? And origin has a identity thesis view of person being reduced to nature. The argumentation of the fifth, the seventh council, particularly in Saint Theodore of the Studite, in on the holy icons, is that the icon does not pick out the divine essence; it picks out the second hypostasis, the Son. And you can circumscribe the second hypostasis because the second hypostasis became circumscribable, aka incarnate. Boom. So the originist point is crucial to understanding that iconoclasm is motivated by Neoplatonic presuppositions. That's the point. Go read this essay. It's very simple, very down to earth, just straight up. Okay, what are the biblical principles behind implicit and explicit for icons, for images, for venerating the created which has been deified. And if you want the best principle behind this, you go and you read the decrees of Ephesus because St. Cyril in condemning Nestorianism, and by the way, Gavin Ortland and all of his cohorts and all the reform, they're all Nestorian. In their Christology, and probably some form of heterodox in terms of their Trinitarian theology as well. Because all of this just flows from Trinity and Christology, period. All of the theology. All of it. Sacraments, ecclesiology, they all flow from Trinity, Triad, and Christology. 
And that's why none of these people have the correct Trinity and Christology doctrines. So they end up heterodox on all these other things. They don't even know Trinitarian and Christological theology. They wouldn't last two minutes in a debate on those topics. I'm not being arrogant. I'm saying we tried to have that debate 10 years ago with Turretin fan before I was even Orthodox. I dude didn't know anything about this stuff. That's, that was, I don't know if he's still James White's dude, but at one point he was. And so James White, he won't debate any of these people. Now, one last thing I want to talk about is uh, this is an interesting paper I found, academic paper today, because a uh, Roman Catholic dude was saying that I made up conspiracies about uh, Marian apparitions and so forth. Uh, do you understand that E. Michael Jones, your own dude, believes, and I'm not saying that it's true because he believes it, but I'm saying it's funny to me that your trad guy thinks that Medjugorje was a CIA PSYOP. Okay, that's because uh, Marchetti, I think maybe AG, and a couple of these writers who were formerly CIA operatives talk about using Marian apparitions and local superstitions. And then I just found this today from Daniel Wojcik, University of Oregon, the Virgin and the Bomb Bayside apparition. Now I know Roman Catholics don't, most of them don't believe Bayside is a uh, approved apparition. I'm just trying to make the point that, okay, let's look at several of these. And if we can begin to see that these modern apparitions, even though they're not approved, are clearly part of psychological operations and CIA operations in the Cold War then that gives us a context to see how it's possible that other recent apparitions, a.k.a. Fatima, might have also been part of this. Now, this has a lot of references in it. I'm not, I can't go into all of these. I'll show you a few of these on the screen. Let's see, make sure we can see this good. Let me get me out of the way so you can just see the full screen. And you'll notice this is from Wikispooks, which has a lot of good references. Just look at the references. I don't care whether you think this is a, a reputable website or not, but the references are, are what are useful here. Because as we go through WikiLeaks, Wiki, excuse me, Wiki Spooks, you'll notice the uh, how they were in the Cold War utilizing Marian symbology and imagery in Latin American publications. And this was studied uh, at a high level in terms of psych uh, psychological operations. They even linked the army field manuals of how to do this. And by the way, I've read Paul Leinberger's book, the guy that they mentioned there, the Godfather of modern CIA operations. I've read his whole book. Uh, it's just old school propaganda techniques. But what this is, is putting symbolism of Mary and imagery uh, and relating to the Cold War in certain areas in the magazines that people would read so that they would have a mental association, right, of um, Rome and CIA good guys, Soviets bad guys. And by the way, I don't think any of these people were bad guys. By the way, here they have the Philip A.G. quote that I mentioned. For example, CIA station in Caracas can cable information on a secret communist plot in Venezuela to Bogota, which can surface through a local propaganda agent attributed to unidentified Venezuelan officials. The information then be picked up in the Colombian press related to the CIA stations in Quito, Lima, La Paz, and Santiago. This is how they were doing these things in con concert with the Vatican during the CIA uh, Latin American, South American operations. So it's not even controversial. Like anybody would have read like a basic text on this would know this, but this guy was like really trying to argue with me today about you made this up. You made it up. <laughs> no, I didn't make it up. This is basic psyops. You read one book on this. You would learn this stuff. Now I'm not saying that there are no miracles or that there's never anything unexplained that occurs and every, I'm not a, I'm not a fedora man, but I'm just saying that this is a real aspect of psychological warfare. That's why uh, William Peter Blatty that did the exorcist he worked in CIA PSYOPs but you didn't even know that did you that was part of the Cold War people don't believe me when I say this especially academics Whoa! yep see this hopefully you can see this So this is an old news clipping detailing this history. 
of the most widely advertised and popular, uh, blah, 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 William Peter Blatty. What did Blatty do? Oh, he graduated from Georgetown University, he worked for the CIA in Lebanon in the 1950s, and he wanted to work in the PSYOPs division in Vietnam, I think. Yes, Vietnam. So then he went and they experimented with these horror movies as Cold War propaganda. Here you go. You can go read the whole essay yourself. He's making it up. It's not real. He's making it up. Here you go. Go read it. I mean, at what point do you guys realize and admit that I maybe I know what I'm talking about, right? Elijah Schaefer said today, were there any pundits? Who was any pundits through the last three years that said it was all fake and great? Uh, right here. Woo, woo. How about right here? Who was right throughout the whole last three years? And not just me, many other people too, but anyway. Okay, so I think that's most of what I wanted to talk about today. If you want this uh, paper on Bayside and the CIA propaganda matrix, here is this research paper you could read. That was really cool. I found today. Oh, it's too long of a link. It doesn't want to. It doesn't let me link it. Um, you can go type in that paper and find it yourself. All you lazies out there. Too lazy to do it. I can't do it. I'm too lazy. And then here's the Wiki Spooks essay with again. Just go look up the links. I'm sure you don't find it as a reputable source. Source? What's your source on that? What's your source on that? Dude, I'm the most source dude, dude out here. When I walked into Timcast, they thought I was a living library. They're like, why has he got all them books? Why he got all them books? By the way, if you didn't watch it, guys, please go watch it and share. We want to get that up to 400,000 views. I'm sandwiched in the midst of the controversy between daily wire and by the way i look garbage there because they fly you in at like get up at six in the morning fly in and do the show that night that's why i look like garbage living garbage that's why i look terrible and they have the worst lighting in there why do people light their podcast with fluorescent lights dude it's like what are you trying to make everybody look like ugly people well it worked because i look hideous and I apologize to all the audience who expected a beautiful diva and they got an ugly old tired, tired man. But I did have a fancy jacket though, I have to say. What is that jacket? I, they were like, what is that? I'm like, I don't know, man. I'm Ryan Seacrest introducing Elvis struggling with sexuality. I don't know what I am. That's what that jacket looked like. But it looks freaking fancy. That's all I know. If you would hit like and share, we're about to go to the call-ins. A lot of fun tonight. I do look like, I, I look like a Ryan Seacrest slash Elvis slash Panamanian drug lord slash car salesman slash boomer on vacation in Florida. All at once somehow. You bet I look tired because I was up at 6 a.m. Flying in and then you go to the hotel and then you go to the show that night. I don't know. I look like garbage, dude. Anyway, go watch this interview if you didn't see it because I got to drop some red, red, red pill rain is falling down. Red pill rain is falling down all over Tim. Get it? Peter Gabriel, red rain. There's a red pill rain in there that night. Uh, And we, you know, we got to talk about a good bit. I'm happy with it. People were like, they didn't let you talk. Well, it's not an interview show. And so that, you know, they make that clear when you go there. It's like, this is not, we interview you. This is everybody comment on, on news show. So it's a little bit of a different format. Uh, you know, when we got to that Scooby-Doo thing, I had nothing to say cause I don't care nothing about it. <laughs> I didn't know anything about it, but, uh, yeah, just a different format. So I don't think they were trying to be, they weren't trying to be, um, like shut me down or something like that. It's just their whole vibe is comment on the news. It's not, it's not Joe Rogan where it's like, you know, deep, deep interview with you. It's you and these, uh, three dudes commenting on the news. 
So, but I had a lot of fun. Everybody's really cool. Um, was really happy and thankful to have that opportunity to speak to so many people and shout out to Chase and shout out to, uh, BHM. Um, thanks to Cassandra and to Sour Patch Lids Lydia for helping me get that set up. Cause I think without those people, that would never would happen. So thank you to all you guys for, uh, helping to make that happen. We don't really talk about Antifa that long. That's like a few minutes. So the majority of that show is actually about, uh, if you go over here to, where's the clips? See this right here? Global elites want technocratic government and then Klaus and the chips. That's the real essence of what we talked about on that podcast. Um, oh, did they, I, I didn't even see this clip. There was a whole other clip they made. I didn't know. I think that's me. Let's see. But uh, if you watch those three clips, you'll get the essence of my segments. Let's see if this is me. I think it is. Maybe not. Oh, yeah. They don't really let me talk much in that part. Well, that, it's not that they didn't let me. I just didn't have much to say. But that's where we're talking about birds. <laughs> How to bird see. Um and then look for this weekend, uh, the Dr. Steve Turley interview will be up this weekend. That was a lot of fun. Uh, we had a, a blast kind of going deep on philosophy. Um, I, didn't, I didn't really know what Dr. Turley wanted to talk about. And uh, he was like, let's get into the history of philosophy and why the West uh, is mired in empiricism and atheism. So it was it was a great talk. I, I didn't expect it to be such a philosophically dense discussion but it was and it was a lot of fun uh, so look for that this weekend shout out to dr steve turley and again i'm really thankful just to be going on these big channels and having that opportunity to speak to so many people it's really growing the audience and if you guys would go and follow dr steve turley uh because he promoted us so fervently in that interview all right let's see if we want to go to open forum chat we have uh, quite a few people here in the chat. We will go one by one and let me explain briefly how it works, guys, so we don't get all flustered and losing our minds. The way this works is you have to request to speak. It only works on the Twitter Space app. When you request to speak, I give you the microphone. When you get the microphone, you unmute yourself. Please don't make me say 500 times, unmute, dude, because it's coming a new, it says new catchphrase and it makes me mean. I get they're making me mean. It's y'all's fault I'm mean because I have to say, I'm you, dude. So did you hear me? That's the way it works. You can make whatever arguments you want for as long as you want within reason, but they have to be arguments and not ad hominems. I don't care if you make jokes. If you make fun of me, I don't care. It's fine. You can do all that, but just make an argument at some point. If you don't make arguments, I will call you out. I will backtrack. Well, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. That's not an argument. But if you were to say something, like, I want to speak for five minutes and make my case against you. You can have it. I don't care. I'm not afraid of your I wanna, argument. I want to read my poetry to you. That is also not allowed. We do not allow your slam poetry. I don't know why people think that we want to hear your poetry on here. And I don't know if it's trolling, but I don't think, them, I don't think those wine moms that want to read their poetry are actually that good at trolling. So... I don't know what's going on, but uh, no slam poetry, no poetry, period. But otherwise, you could make whatever arguments you want. Within reason, if you get crazy, you just immediately get it booted. Errant, what's up, dude? Shout out to Father Deacon. Welcome to the chat. What's up, Errant? I'm you, dude. <laughs> I'm you, dude. Uh, uh, wait. Wait, I'm, I'm muted. I'm, okay, no, I'm good. No, I'm you're good. not. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. okay. So, uh, no, sorry. I uh, got a lame question for you. Not any kind of debate or anything. Sure. Um, is there an OSB that you consider much better than the other ones? I'm a catechumen, and I would love a quality one. Mine has some errors in it. You said, you're saying the Orthodox Study Bible has errors in it? What do you mean? So, um, for example, the Orthodox Study Bible that I have, and it's from... St. Athanasius um, Orthodox Academy. Um, it said that Jesus was tempted and it didn't offer any sort of um, explanation that really 
made that put that in context and i spoke to other people about that and it was meaning like he was tempted like like how satan you know like the oprah clip it's like satan dared to tempt him but he himself wasn't tempted um but is there an osb that you consider is just like well i mean i only i only know about one orthodox study bible and that's this one from ancient faith ministries which i've always thought was good Uh, there may be there may be mistakes in the notes but I mean, Jesus was tempted, but the difference is that he doesn't have uh, the corrupt nature of Ad, the, that we inherit from nature, which would give way to the blameful passions. So Jesus has, by will, he willed to take on the blameless passions. And so the temptations that were presented to him were external to him, but he was not moved in an internal way to sin. So that's the distinction that I would say. But I, I don't, I mean, I haven't seen that note in the OSB, but I haven't read every note, so I, I don't know. But I'm only aware of one Orthodox study Bible. Okay, okay. And then um, I'd also ask you, uh, so uh, is there is there a good work um, that gets heavy into, uh, maybe not too heavy, but like a good um, summary of some of the canons, or is that just something I'm going to have to kind of like look up myself and read about, or is there like a good essay or a good work that kind of, um, that you would suggest? The canons of the councils? Yeah, like, um, to get into some of the anathematized beliefs and stuff. I mean, no, I don't know of any work that summarized them because, uh, some of the, uh, canons and documents have only recently been translated, like in the Richard Price books. So there's not like one mega collection of the canons of the, of the councils. There is the rudder, which is the normative thing for the Orthodox church, but, um, which has the canons, but there's not the list of the canons that I mean other than the rudder I don't know what else you would go to but that's not an, an academic thing because it's it's, it's for the bishops to uh, interpret and impose it's not it's, it's church law so it's not really something mm-hmm. that's for the laity but you could read you know books that summarize the teachings of the, of the councils and their anathemas uh, I mean you could read pretty much any treatise like my endorsed Byzantine theology would give you the overview of the first, you know, seven councils in their, in their theology. Okay. Wonderful. I'm going to look into that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good questions. Yeah. I mean, the Orthodox study Bible is a study Bible. So, you know, people in the notes can make mistakes. I would say that, uh, throughout the notes in the Orthodox study Bible, I've seen maybe four or five places in hundreds of notes that I thought were bad arguments or not very good, but 90, 95% are pretty good. So it's overall, it's a great study model. Um, metaverse only. What's up, dude? Metaverse only. Is you racist? Hello? Yes, sir. Yep. Hey, Jay, what's up, man? How you doing? Doing great. How are you? I'm all right, man. Sorry, you're so, you're so over here trying to be mean, man. Just planning how to be mean to you. That's all I'm doing. Nah, that's all good, man. That's all good. Um, but sorry, I got to ask this question again. Sure. You probably don't remember me, but I asked you this question a while ago about okay. pretty much what books and literature. <clears throat> you cut out, start over. roots that the church fathers are operating under. <clears throat> You cut out. Start over. In their works. Start over. You cut out. I said I was. I was asking you. Do you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was asking you about uh, what book to get into to read and to be able to understand the philosophical roots that the church fathers are pretty much operating under in their works. I remember you told me there was one by. Uh, one father, I couldn't remember him. Um, well, that my, that's my fault too because I didn't have a pencil on me to write them yeah, down. That's I fine. Just so post the, I wouldn't the chat and everything, but I wouldn't say that it's one work per se. But the best book for an introduction to Cappadocian philosophical thought is this book, The Metamorphosis. Uh, Christianity and Classical Culture, The Metamorphosis of Natural Theology in the uh, Christian Encounter with Hellenism. This is the Best book on the the philosophy of the Cappadocians, hands down, by Yaroslav Pelikan. Do you see it right there on the screen? Uh, I'm actually I'm actually on the space on my phone, so That's I fine. can't see it. Uh, 
but yeah, I just wanted to get the names because I didn't I didn't have a pencil on me last time to write them down. Yeah, okay. So this book is great for explaining the how the Cappadocians appropriate concepts and terms and transform them in their defense of Christianity from a philosophical perspective, particularly the Trinity, because this is where the Cappadocians are most important. Uh, and it's called Christianity and Classical Culture by Yaroslav Pelikan, P-E-L-I-K-A-N. It's the best book, hands down, describing all of those terms that you hear all the time. Hypostasis, logi, energies, all of that comes up. Uh, Father as soul cause, all of that comes up in this excellent text. It's a must-have. Okay, gotcha. And is there any other books I should look into or that's well i mean if you need to make your way through that one first that was that that one's about 400 pages and it's pretty serious so you make your way through that one first and then come back and i'll give you some more (laughs) i mean this this is no joke man this this is a serious text i mean this is not a this is not a uh it's not a slow boy text but any other questions um no i'm good right there uh okay i guess um Question will be though. Sure. Father, Father Deacon, do you have any recommendations for me before I go? As far as books, sorry, I was only I was. Yeah, I was, I was constructing of... arguments in my science lab, philosophical arguments in my science lab. Uh, I think Jay already mentioned Meindorf, Byzantine theology. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a good one. Um. Pelican, did you mention that? That's the one I just mentioned, yeah. Yeah. Uh, b- 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 <sighs> There's a good book by uh, Lasky called Dogmatic Theology, which gets into yeah, some of this. Um, All right, let's move on. Uh, let's see. Yeah. N- Neyman. Neiman? You got your Russian name. I can't read that Russian. I can't read no Kyrillic. Neiman? <clears throat> Hello there. Yeah, what's up, Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, since uh, geopolitics one is one of the topics, I would like to ask you mm-hmm. uh, how much are you aware about situation uh, between Serbia and so-called Kosovo, and uh, can you make some comments about Serbian church, and do you know the problems that we have with liberal and Western agendas, so to say. Uh, I don't know a lot beyond just kind of basics. So, I mean, we have a lot of Serbian dudes in the Discord, um, but I don't know. I, that, serve, I serve in Serbia. Yeah. Father Deacon probably knows better than me. I, I don't know the internal Serbian stuff, no. I think they're, I think they're one of the better ones uh, out there. Um... Uh, I think he's talking about in Serbia, or are you talking about in the U.S.? I I am from Serbia, and I just wanted to mention the situation with Kosovo, so-called Kosovo. Uh, uh, the it's disputed territory. We claim it is uh, ours, and they claim it is independent. And now there are tensions. Uh, Serbian uh, churches are constantly attacked serbian people that live there by albanians are constantly attacked and uh, the narrative in the west is that we are the bad guys and we did the massacres and genocide not only in kosovo but in bosnia and croatia and so on no i think everybody over here knows that's bolt that's fake that's that's all that was it was the u.s and nato that did all that yeah, I mean, the breakup of Yugoslavia was bloody and there were war crimes at all sides, but but in the end we are the bad guys and now our territory is just uh, breaking up. First Bosnia, then uh, Montenegro, now they try to Kosovo. Kosovo is de facto independent, they have their, their own government but we claim it is ours and their independence is a violation of every international law but it's a precedent that now is problematic with uh, Crimea and Donbas and so I mean it's a Pandora box that that's been opened uh, when the world was unipolar 
and now uh, now it's uh, after it was opened now it's chaotic uh, throughout the world because there are no rules that can be uh, solidified applied to everyone if we have no territorial integrity that if anyone can claim independence on its own then it is what is what's happening but also i want to mention it because our church is perceived as liberals and west as some kind of crime organization that 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 serves political regimes and so on but uh, it is very important for Serbian faith and Serbian church, uh, Kosovo, because it has really uh, many uh, it, monasteries, many monasteries are there, and uh, medieval uh, heritage. And the, we, we had the Battle of Kosovo in 1389 against the Turks, uh, and it is in our DNA uh, to recall that battle because uh, from our perspective we chose heaven instead of earthly uh, serve, instead of yeah. earth so to say and I just wanted to tell people about it I think it is uh, maybe it may be interesting to some of you and it's really important for, for us yeah man I appreciate that yeah I think the the West uh, sees these things as uh, enemies because of the religious heritage. Absolutely. Debate with Nate. What's up, man? Did you want to talk about, uh, you were asking questions about icons. And isn't that providential because I just brought up that text. Look at that. Uh, what is that? That's the text that I was mentioning in Joshua where it says that <clears throat> Joshua uh, tore his clothes, fell on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening and put dust on their heads. And so you're saying, well, they're not reverencing the Ark. I mean, I thought the Protestant point was that we don't bow down before created things. And then here we have him bowing down before a created thing. And then now it's, oh, well, he wasn't reverencing it. Well, what's he doing if he's not reverencing it? Can you hear me all right? Yes, sir. Cool, cool. Um, I guess I'll clarify for context, like, I think the distinction between Latria and Dulia is valid. Okay. And, you know, I'm an ortho-curious prot, I would say, so I'm just learning. Okay. But uh, what I was trying to say is, like, I just don't find those OT versus convincing of the argument. Um, I think there might be other good arguments. Um, if it's all right, I actually wanted to ask a question maybe a clarification, so less of a debate okay. about what sure. I think was one of Gavin's larger points. Sure. Um, so I thought one of the larger points was that Nicaea 2 anatomatizes anyone right. who doesn't venerate the icons in a certain fashion, which to me seems to go beyond just giving them respect and honor. So, you know, I don't think the iconoclasts or I do believe the icon class were wrong. Um, I see that distinction. I think icon veneration can be beneficial. But would you agree that the church is directed by the council to anathemat anathematize anyone who doesn't, you know, specifically kiss and bow to the icons? Absolutely. Okay. Sure. So, you know, for me, yeah, if, absolutely. if I were to become a catechumen, uh -huh. for example, but I weren't comfortable with that, in my veneration of icons you know as a clarification of the orthodox position is that extremely problematic okay so but let's go through the overall point here because i want to i want to hone in on what the specific problem is because typically and i don't know if this is your issue but typically when we have this discussion with protestants the the problem is is usually first they'll say something like and i don't i'm not saying you're saying this so this is just what they typically say well you shouldn't bow down before these types of things okay so they they typically think of it as an external action now we always point out that I, I, idols are not something that are solely known by our bodily actions in other words i might never bow down to something that's a a, a false idea but i could conceivably make an i an idol out of an idea uh, let's say I'm just a, I, I am enamored with communism and I think that communism is some sort of 
you know, uh, couldn't that conceivably be an idol, even though I never physically bow down? So the point I'm trying to make is that the essence of idolatry is not the bodily action. It's the interior disposition, because I can conceivably make any created thing into an idol. So the bodily action is secondary to, it's not essential to what it is to have an idol. And when we look in the Old Testament, when we see that we're not supposed to make idols of, of God, that's also clarified to be not images of the Father or the divine essence, because all there are valid images, there are valid manifestations. For example, when the form of God shows itself to Isaiah or to other uh, Old Testament saints, and they're actually put to death in the case of Isaiah because they claim to, quote, see God. Jesus asked this question to the Pharisees in John 5 when he says, when Moses went up on the mountain, if nobody sees the Father, who did Moses see face to face? So the principle comes down to, first and foremost, visible representation of the divine. So if there is visible rep representation of, of the divine, then certain things follow from that. If there's not, then we are iconoclasts and the entire principle is wrong. But most Protestants do admit certain types of representations of the divine for example the bible when i when i write when i see the word j-e-s-u-s -S, that is a created word signifying a divine thing and most protestants think that the bible is a quote holy book and so protestants will treat the bible as something in, with that same incarnational principle that with that same reverence and my, I'm making the point that if you understand that the energy that deifies and changes the Eucharist into the real presence is no different than the energy that's present in this holy book, and that's no different than the energy that's present in the holy icons, because for us, icons are written just like the words of the Bible are written. And so it's the exact same uncreated energetic power that's present in those that is present in the relics of the saints because of the deifying energies. So the, for, so the reverencing, for example, of Elisha's bones is no different than the reverencing of the cloths from Paul's body, which healed people in the book of Acts. That's the exact same principle in the first century of the church when they have and revere the relics of the martyrs. So it all kind of goes together. And if that's the, if that, that's the point I'm trying to make, so at that point, you would have to explain to me where exactly is the idolatry and where exactly is the problem in, in what you're saying? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with it being an inner disposition. Okay. And, you know, I, I don't see bowing and kissing in and of itself being idolatrous. It's, uh, it's a matter of the heart. But uh, I guess the segues into my last question. You know, <laughs> a big obstacle for me is the anathematizing, let's say, of any Christians, or at least I consider them to be brothers in Christ now, who wouldn't subscribe to that form of veneration. So, well, hold on. You know, the, ana the anathema, is it, is it complete separation from God? Can, can people, you know, can I call myself a Christian now? Um, no, because it goes along with the doctrine of the church. You can't separate the doctrine of the church from the incarnation and from uh, the worship of the church. They all go together. And Protestant churches are not churches. They are parachurches and they are heterodox. And the key here is that it's not just a matter of what we call ourselves. It's what do we actually believe and what is our historical connection and lineage. And if you don't have apostolic succession, you're not a church. It doesn't matter. I mean, you can believe a lot of right things, and I'm not knocking you or saying that you don't have any grace or anything like that, but you can have grace and believe heterodox things on the path to becoming orthodox. So incarnation conditions the doctrine of the church. The doctrine of the church is that we are the body of Christ. We are not split up amongst 30,000 different groups all as the body of Christ. There's only one body of Christ because the gates of hell can't prevail against it. We're the only church that teaches the exact same thing as the church of the first thousand years. So while it might be a hard pill to swallow, um, no, if you're a Protestant, you're not, uh, you're not part of the church. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's consistent. You there? <clears throat> you cut out. You're muted. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> You there? 
Nate, you're muted again. Shoot, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Wow, well, it keeps muting on me. I don't know why, but no. I... Technical difficulties. Maybe I should just sign off. Uh, well, I mean, you go ahead and try. You can also come out and come back in if you want. That's another way to do it. <clears throat> well, no, I'm just going to say it's consistent what you're saying with what I've read. Mm -hmm. I think some people try to soften it, soften it by saying we know where the church is, not where it isn't. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, that, that, I just kind of want a conf confirmation of the uh, orthodox position on that. Yeah, I so. mean, that's that is the classical orthodox position, and I, you know, it's not that I'm trying to be arrogant. I'm just, you know, we want to see people come to the truth, so I'm going to honestly tell you what what the orthodox position is. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I disagree for now, but uh, I think that's consistent. So I appreciate that. All right, take care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good questions. I'll be interested to hear exactly on what basis there is a disagreement. I mean. What is it? I mean, so I know that you're saying you disagree with the idea that we anathematize the iconoclast, but do you understand that the reasoning of the Seventh Council is that iconoclasm is motivated by Neoplatonism? So how can the church, who spent seven centuries battling Hellenism and Neoplatonism, say, well, actually, in this case, it's okay? Because the iconoclast principle doesn't just get rid of icons. It destroys the real presence. It destroys baptismal regeneration, which is the uniting of the uncreated energies with the water to regenerate people. I mean, it destroys the doctrine of the church, which is the uh, which is founded on the incarnation. So iconoclasm has these tremors that send the ripples throughout the rest of the system if we allow it. That's why you, we can't allow it. It's connected to, logically connected to, all of these other doctrines. And so if iconoclasm is okay in the church, then by extension, so is denying of the real presence, so is denying of uh, baptismal regeneration, so is denying that the visible unity of the church, and we're back to invisible church and uh, the, her the heresies of uh, Calvin and Nestorianism. It would be an admission of Nestorianism and Neoplatonism. Why would we want to admit that those things were right when we just spent several centuries saying they're wrong? Yeah, and no, I, I see what you mean by all these concepts being tied together, which uh, I'll just have to give more thought and prayer about, and especially, uh, yeah, especially denial of, I guess, that specific form of veneration being in denial of the incarnation. So, yeah, clarification of the orthodox position is what I was looking for, not a debate today. So. That's fine. Yeah, good questions. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome yeah. back anytime, Nate. Uh, thank you for those questions. Um, Jay, I was also going to say, too, sure. this is a point of clarification. The statement, um, we know where the church is, but we don't know where it's not, is made up by a communist. Um, it's not found anywhere in orthodoxy. Um, and some people will say, oh, it's where the, we know where the Holy Spirit is, but we know don't know where the, the Holy Spirit's not. That itself is not even patristic. Um, the idea of the Holy Spirit everywhere present, filling all things, that's true. And, and uh, bringing um, as the spirit of truth and uh, acting on the conscience, all people into the body of Christ, the Orthodox Church is true. But I just want to make that clear that that was something that was made up fairly recently uh, by an ecumenist to kind of blur the distinctions. <coughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, Kevin Barry, what's up, dude? <coughs> Welcome. Hello, hello. Hey, Kevin. How you doing? I'm doing good, my friend. Hey, Jay, just want to congratulate you on the uh, extra exposure for Tim Pool and uh, the launching of your philosophy course. Thank you. Appreciate that. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I have a couple of questions, and then I have a little light debate topic I want to propose to you and sure. uh, try my hand at. Um, so first question for you, um, <clears throat> what does it mean to be anathematized, to fit underneath an uh, underneath an anathema in a council what is that saying about that certain individual or that category of individual that does x thing that's been anathematized 
Yeah, it signifies being uh, outside uh, outside of the church. And so the purpose of anathemas is not that we want to... Can you mute when you're not talking? It's really loud. Sorry about that. It's okay. Yeah, so the purpose of anathemas is actually the restoration of the person. So it, the point is not, uh, let's, uh, let's figure out who all can we damn to hell this week. No, it's hopefully those people will uh, be restored... And that's why it exists, because there's this fear of being outside of the church, right? So uh, if you look at the anathemas of um, Sunday of Orthodoxy, these are important because the Orthodox Church is really the only church that still does these uh, traditional anathemas that come out of the Seventh Council, right? So the Seventh Council, for example, you'll notice, um, and different bishops at different times have kind of added certain things onto this, like uh, Metropolitan Seraphim of Piraeus, he actually adds some uh, anathemas that relate to modern cults like Jehovah's Witnesses, which just rehash ancient Aryan techni- uh, uh, principles. So if you notice, uh, this is just a sample of the Orthodox Church YouTube channel where they talk about anathematizations of those who destroy the holy images. And this one is unique because this one comes out of Russia where they were anathematizing those who sought to impose papism. And so it's actually a liturgical service where they sing the anathemas. And, and I'm stressing this because people need to understand no other church still sings the anathemas that come out of the Seventh Council. And so I'm arguing against Roman Catholics and other people who think that they're in continuity with the first thousand years. If you're Protestant, then I'm sure you don't care. But for those who are Roman Catholics, uh, why do you not sing and keep the Seventh Council and his teachings? Roman Catholics cl- claim to believe the Seventh Council, but they don't. And if you go to Snack's Twitter feed this week, he showed that they don't. They don't keep the things that are in the canons of the Seventh Council. They don't sing these anathemas. Maybe some of the Uniates do, but they don't actually keep the theology of the Council. It's not a matter of just giving verbal credence to the Seventh Council, because the Seventh Council says you don't make images of God the Father as if he were an incarnate old man. And the Roman Catholics absolutely do that. And they've been doing it to teach filioque through icons that they push into orthodox areas. They're those stupid heterodox icons that they push. Okay, so that's the purpose of anathemas is the restoration of those who find themselves put without the church. That they will repent of their errors and come back because it's a serious thing to be anathematized by the church. Gotcha. I appreciate that insight. Um, <clears throat> and the conversation you were just having with uh, the Protestant who was ortho curious, as uh-huh. he described himself. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious. Your your definition <coughs> of idolatry, if I remember, tell me if I'm wrong, was it's not so much to do with an outward sign or action per se, but it's more to do with the inward disposition. Correct. correct. So it, it may manifest. It may manifest as an exterior uh, bowing before idols, but yeah. the essence of it begins in the heart because we can conceivably make an idol of something that isn't physical, like an idea. Uh, I was just reading uh, Palamas talking about the the when he was critiquing Barleum and the Thomas. He says that they have created a form of logismoi that he calls ideolatry. They they idolize an idea from Hellenism. And so he's calling an idea. And, but at no point do you physically bow down before the idea. Yeah, that totally makes sense to me. I, I guess what I'm curious about is I have two scriptures in mind. Okay. Maybe you can help me better understand with sure. your understanding of idolatry. Um, so obviously, uh, for example, Exodus 32, golden calf, that's the most popular form of idolatry probably in the Western world. Mm-hmm. And just in common idioms, um, in it, you know, Aaron specifically says, uh, you know, let's let's worship this cow mm-hmm. and have a feast to Yahweh. Like, he uses the actual hallowed name of God mm-hmm. uh, in the Hebrew and the Septuagint. And so there it seems like clearly they have a pollution in their mind of the customs of Egypt, but it seems in Aaron's heart he still thought it was a feast for Yahweh, for the Father. So, uh, you know, I'm curious... What, how, how would I box it in there? And maybe right. another so, example be, uh, if I could just say one more sure, thing, Jeremiah 10, another example is coming to mind. There was some sort of practice where people were cutting down trees and decorating them and thinking the trees could animate or something. And he, he was saying, don't do as the heathen do and don't do that. And that was some sort of pagan practice back then. 
But I imagine the Israelites then also didn't think they were doing something against Yahweh, but uh, it was still a heathen practice that they were imitating. So I'm yeah, curious on your thoughts on that. Sure. So let's look at, uh, if you would, just mute so it doesn't get the background noise. <clears throat> I mean, you can talk when you're ready to talk as, as long as you want to, but so let's remember that in, remember that in Exodus three, we had uh, a bush that was burning that Moses saw. Correct. Right. So do you think that was a visible manifestation? Well, like, was there actually a burning uh, a bush that appeared to be burning, but wasn't burned? Yeah. That he was. Yeah, I mean, there was a, there was a phys, in some way a yeah. physical theoph. We call them theophany, right? A divine manifestation. Yeah. And okay. we're told we're told we're told uh, in Exodus uh, twenty three and also in thirty two that that is somebody, right? Right. Who who do you think that is? Just out of curiosity, we're going to get to the point you're making about the calf, but. Um. Well, I originally thought it was Yahweh, but I, I have, is it, is it, uh, is it the logos? Correct. Gotcha. Okay. So first of all, we're making the point that even in the book of Exodus, we actually have visible manifestations of God. And so later on, when other prophets like Isaiah talk about seeing this same visible manifestation that Moses saw, they are persecuted and in Isaiah's case, he's killed because he claimed to see, quote, see God or to see a form of God. So right. let's keep, so let's keep in mind that the first principle is that there are visible manifestations of God that are called Yahweh and identified as God in the text of Exodus. And so, for example, in Exodus 23, it identifies that angel of the Lord that is present in the, the bush as the one who has the divine name. It says, my name is in him, in that angel. That's who was speaking in the bush saying, I am. So that's a second person that's not the father, but has the same attributes and divine name as the father. And if we look over in <clears throat> uh, Exodus 32, what we read is, it came to pass on the next day, I'm going down to verse 30. It came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, you committed a great sin. Go up and make atonement for your sin. Moses returned to the Lord and said, I pray for these people. They have made a great sin. They have made themselves a God of gold. Yet now forgive their sin if you'll forgive it. And uh, if if you do, but if not, uh, do not blot me out of the book that you've written. Excuse me, if not, blot me out of the book. Then the Lord said to Moses, whoever sins against me, I will blot him out of the book. Therefore go down. And I spoke, as I spoke to you before, behold, the angel will go before your face. And if you go back to, and then in, in the next chapter, it again identifies that angel, that messenger as the son. So the point is that when Jesus explains this text in John 5, he says that when Moses was talking to the Israelites and when Moses went up on the mountain and, and met with this angel, Jesus says he was meeting face to face with me. And so he says, but you Pharisees, you know, and you say, no one has seen the father at any time. So there's some valid, visible face-to-face -face thing that can, that can occur, which happens in chapter 33, which can be described even in written text of scripture, right? Would you agree that the words of scripture are in some way images? Oh, of course. Yeah. Okay. So there's no difference in principle between written text of scripture, which are images and an icon, which is just another type of image that describes this event, because we have, for example, icons of the burning bush, and we know from the icons of the burning bush that it's Jesus in the burning bush in terms of our theology. Now, at the same time, in the book of Exodus, there are prescriptions about what images to put in the temple, right? Do you agree with that? Yes, definitely. Okay. And so we do have holy images in the temple. So the prescription against the, uh, the idolatry that you mentioned in uh, chapter 32 is a false theology which would predicate divinity or that God the Father was in some way symbolized or depictable in a golden calf. Because in Orthodox theology, the icons have to teach right theology. That's why, for example, in the Seventh Council, it specifies there is no image of God the Father because Jesus said, no one has seen the Father at any time. That's why you can't do an old man. 
That's why you can't depict the divine essence. There is no image of the divine essence. The only image that's depictable is the Logos who manifested as an image in the book of Exodus that could be seen face to face by Moses and the Israelites and then who took on human nature. And if that human nature was circumscribable, then the Logos in his human nature is circumscribable. That's the argumentation of the Seventh Council from these passages, by the way. So does that make sense that uh, the, the reason that the golden calf is wrong is not just because it's an image and it's not just because it's an image supposed to be symbolic to of Yahweh it's a false image of Yahweh which teaches a false theology because Yahweh is not imaged by a bull he's not incarnate as a bull he's only incarnate as the logos the second person of the godhead that's the only lawful image of the father is the son jesus says he who has seen me has seen the father and so paul calls the son the direct icon of the father in the greek okay fascinating so if i just had to i guess distill that basically the nuance is uh, <clears throat> maybe their disposition was uh you know as polluted as it may be maybe they thought they were worshiping yahweh but in fact they were trying to depict Yahweh, the Father, who is unseen and shouldn't be depicted, much like the Catholic mistake of having Michelangelo paint God the Father as some old man. Or Correct. The Renaissance stuff. Is that what I'm understanding? Absolutely. Yeah, the image the image has to teach the right theology, because for us, let's say you had an, uh, an icon um, the of Jesus, uh, let's say, J- Jesus... Um, I don't know, uh, uh, dis, uh, 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 ceasing to be human and then uh, um, becoming a uh, an avatar. And let's say you had an, I got one. Let's say that you had an a, a, an icon of Jesus present teaching through Buddha. And I'm sure there is some kind of icon like that, right? Like it's the spirit of the Logos coming upon the Buddha to teach. And some people believe this, like perennialists believe this, right? The logo spoke through Buddha. The logo spoke through Muhammad, right? Let's say you had an icon that taught that. For us, the problem is not the principle of iconography. The problem is that the icon teaches a false theology. And that's why icons are very precise in Orthodox theology that you can't, for example, let me give another example. You can't depict the person of the Holy Spirit in, in Orthodox iconography. It's not allowed. You can only depict the Holy Spirit in the way that he energetically manifests, namely as tongues of fire and as dove. And he is not in his person a dove or a tongue of fire. Those are energetic manifestations of the person of the Holy Spirit. But we are not told what the Holy Spirit looks like any more than we are told what the Father looks like. And that's why Orthodox iconography does not depict the person of the Holy Spirit or the person of the Father other than the lawful image of the sun or the lawful image of the energetic manifestation of the spirit as tongues of fire and dove. Fascinating. Okay. That, that, that's very helpful. Thank you, Jack. Absolutely. Um, Great questions. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I also wanted to ask in relation to the councils um, and their Christological definitions, what exactly does the word person mean? Uh, you know, am I lame in understanding? I think, person i just think a distinct human being but what does person mean maybe as opposed to nature as well if you just give me a quick rundown of that right so eventually uh coming out of the cappadocian uh era especially uh basil's letters a person is distinct from nature because the person is the agent or the subject that has that nature and that gets very precise by the time of the fifth and the sixth councils and particularly in the writings of saint maximus and saint john damascus person cannot just be an it is an instance of nature but it's not reducible to an instance of nature and the reason we know that first and foremost is that it comes out of our trinitarian theology if person was just an an instance of nature we would be modalists because the father would just be an instance of the nature just as much as the son is an instance of nature they are the subjects or the agents that have the nature and so nature is what a thing is and person answers the question of who i am the person jay You're the person, Kevin. You and I share a common nature. But you are also distinct because the person, Jay, is not the person, Kevin. And so you have the nature that you have in a unique manifestation or a unique mode as the person, Kevin. 
you instantiate human nature in a unique mode. This is the fancy term in hypostatized, the mode in which the nature exists as the person, Kevin. Human nature exists in me as the mode of the person, J. And that's all based on our Trinitarian theology. So Christology reflects Trinitarian theology 100% in a purely 100% reflexive move so that there is no, absolutely no disparity between person and nature in the Trinity and between person and nature in the incarnate Christ. And thus person and nature in human persons is modeled in the exact same way. If this is being posted on YouTube, I'm definitely going to re-listen that part. If I could present a challenge to you, is there any way you could explain that to me as if I was a third grader? So again, you and I are individuals, right? Yeah. But we have things in common, right? Correct. So in Orthodox theology, basing itself on the Christology of the first seven councils, what you and I have in common is that we have a common body, mind, soul, and will. Doesn't mean we have the same body, mind, soul, and will, but we have body, mind, soul, and will in common. And that makes up what is called nature or what is common. So body, mind, soul, and will is universal to every human being that's a human being. They all have that to make them what they are. But we also have something that we don't share in common, which is particular, which individuates us. And the, the principle ultimately, it's not the only thing that individuates because my body is not identical to your body. My body is beautiful. Yours is not. I'm just joking. Uh, we, we have, we have, I'm just kidding. We have uh, features that individuate us, but what really sets us apart is that you're the distinct person, Kevin. And person is the haver of the nature and the faculties of nature. Kevin has human nature, human will, human mind, human body, human soul. And you have it in a unique way that I don't have it as Kevin, the agent, the subject, Kevin, I have human nature as the agent or subject J, but it exists in a unique way that I have it. So there's common things between us, but there's also particularizing what are called in theology idiomata and the hypostatic or personal properties in this case that really picks out the distinctions is, is what person is. Does that make sense? So it's more than just nature. It's the, it's the who that has the nature. So again, the simplest explanation Nature answers the question of what a thing is. Person answers the question of who. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. My very last... Uh, Father, guess, hold on, hold on. Father Deacon, are you there? I'm here. Could you field this question? Because I really have to go TT in the little girl's room. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. It is a great way to put it. Go ahead. Uh, just reduce everything to the PP, dude. Exactly. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to say what Jay said was uh, well put. Um, nature essence answers what, and person answers who. And a nature belongs to the subject, the person. And I think it's important to, there is a distinction that it's more than just an instance of a human nature, a human being walking right there in front of me. It is, like Jay said, it is that. Um, but it's more than that. It can't be reduced. That's why sometimes you might hear nature, sorry, personhood transcends nature. Have you heard that phrase? No, I haven't. Stop me if you've heard this one. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and the idea there is, is just kind of a nice way to put what I just said, that you can't fully explain it and reduce it to an essence or nature. And that means there's something mysterious to you. Because for the Greeks... In philosophers, to explain something is to give an essential definition, i.e. the essence. Right. But philosophy has never been able to fully explain personhood. Why? Because it transcends essence. It's what an essence belongs to. Uh, when we're speaking of the divine or the human. And so there's something mysterious in the person. 
it can't be fully explained by simply just reducing it to nature. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I guess like from what I understand from both of you, nature is something that's almost like Jay said. It's a what? It's almost like a formula, <laughs> and then a who is more. I guess particular, um, not in common with all. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's unique. Each person's unique. That's a good point. The nature's common. Okay, I'm back. Thank well, you yeah. for that. Welcome back. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you. Yes, great um, to be you here. Were, you were very Honor. missed for that short period of time. Uh, did you have well, any more, Kevin, or did you want to move on or not? Yeah, I had one last um, sure. topic I'd like to cover, if that's all right. Go ahead. Um, so first, just to ask you to clarify a position. Okay. Um, relating to Christendom, relating to uh, you know God-ordained government, um, would you say that what you see as the best form of government would be Christian monarchy with uh, the church and state working together with the orthodox church and a confessional state yeah that's right just that's one, ideal one sure. additional thing and that would be a, a big a bitcoin economy <laughs> yeah i think that okay. form of government would be the ideal form sure okay so you know what i'm trying to wrestle with and understand right now is uh i have a few scriptures that feels like well, obviously, you have the book of Judges. You have uh, God set up a, a, a kingdom of Judges, First Samuel 8. Uh, they ask for a king. Samuel thinks it's evil in his eyes. Deuteronomy gives a stipulation for a king if the nations want to be like the others around him. As it says in Deuteronomy and First Samuel. Yeah, the law of kings. And, sorry, what? It's called the law of kings. Yeah, we know. Yeah, okay. Um, and then you have Gideon, who is a righteous judge. And Judges 8 saying... Gideon? Well, yeah, Gideon. Um, Gideon saying that uh, when he's asked to be king and his, his heir be king, he says, uh, you know, I'm not going to rule over you. You know, Yahweh, God is going to rule over you. And he denies that to keep the system of judges. And also, I've done a little light studying of Aristotle and Aristotle's politics. And uh, it seems that he very, very much favors a meritocratic kind of judges or public government from what I understand uh, those might not be the exact right term so I'm just curious you know what do you do with all that how does that all play into your view of uh, the best form of government yeah so my godfather wrote a really great essay on this called on Christian monarchy which I recommend uh, everybody can go read this here I'll put it in the chat for you and uh, I mean he replies to many of those objections so the first point is that there was always intended to be an eventual monarchy because monarchy is predicted in Genesis 49 uh, it predicts the royal house of David in Genesis 49, and that the scepter would not depart from Judah until Shiloh came. So monarchy is not antithetical to the, the system that God intended for the Israelites. What he rebukes is a king like the nations around them. So you were correct in that key phrase. And one of the points of the books of Judges actually is that Judges is a pro-monarchy book. I'm not fussing at you. It's just that people overlook this because multiple times we have the phrase and there was no king in israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes judges is an a pro-monarchy apologetic because the judges period was one of the worst periods in israel's history and yes there were evil kings but monarchy is predicted in genesis 49 it is the only form of government that the history of the orthodox church has ever given coronation approval to it's a semi-sacramental service a coronation ceremony the church has done it for hundreds of years it's the uh, form of government that the church providentially accepts in the ecumenical councils and particularly by the seventh council uh, and so uh, i mean monarchy has produced many saints uh, many saints who talk about it talk about there are no saints in the orthodox church who have ever mentioned democracy or republics so what Aristotle said is cool and all, but has absolutely nothing to do with the history of the church and its theology. I would also add that multiple times throughout the book of Proverbs, you have consistent statements about the benefits of monarchy, the benefits of a uh, society with hierarchy and nobility, 
Um, and so that those are also overlooked arguments for uh, for monarchy. And when Paul says in Romans 13 that the uh, authority, Roman Imperium, is ordained of God. So even though they might be evil, they're still ordained of God. And that was the attitude that the church took um, into the period of the councils when, we, when, when they had an orthodox imperium. So uh, the idea that the ideal form of government would be some sort of democracy or republic is actually an argument that resurrects at the time of the uh, Renaissance uh, occultists and then uh, by the uh, Protestant uh, reformers to get rid of that. Well, with that, then, do you see elements of, say, with an, an econ economic model like capitalism or a governmental model like meritocracy being um, subordinate supplements to this, uh, to Christian monarchy? At all. Wait, would what be? Say that again. Um, capitalism and uh, meritocracy. People being able to raise through the hierarchy, hierarchy of society through their merit, through their skills, uh, through their capacity for growing in any. Uh, I any mean, I don't form. have any. I don't have any idea of a perfect system that would tell you what the best way to rise up in society would be in terms of free markets and. I mean, I understand the danger that can exist with uh, having a monarch, but actually, you know, monarchy can also be a system that's uh, very limited in, in, in the irony is that republics and democracies tend to be the ones that have these uh, bloated bureaucracies and uh, legalities and laws and insane levels of taxation in, in reality. Uh, I know there's a lot of propaganda that says, oh, the monarchy was all the worst for all this stuff, but it was it really. I'm not sure it was, but um I mean, the so society's values are going to be determined by their civilizational ethos. And if you have a Christian civilization and ethos, it's not going to be formulated first and foremost by enlightenment neoliberal ideologies of, its, of, of the goods of society. So in a capitalist society is organized around the enlightenment ethos of atomized individualism and the individual being able to rise up through merit. Now, there should be ideally some way for people to rise up through merit. I agree, but I just don't know that the system that we live in actually even really does that. Uh, uh, I don't have an answer to the perfect economic solution for these kinds of scenarios, but I am trying to figure out, okay, what does divine revelation teach us about, you know, how society is best constructed versus, um, you know, lies that come out of the enlightenment that, you know, I mean, if you think about enlightenment motivations, uh, the, the formulators of, you know, social contract and all this kind of stuff, I mean, they explicitly say that they're formulating a society which is not theistic. Okay, these are, those are secular presuppositions. The problem with secular presuppositions is on what basis is it a good to allow people to rise up in society at all? Like, we need a basis for the good it's not good enough to just say that there's a good. There has to be some account for the good. So you need a worldview. You need a paradigm. You need an ethos. You can't build a civilization on enlightenment reductionist principles. It just doesn't work. We, we are in that right now. How well is it going building a society on reductivist enlightenment principles? There might be... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say not good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there might be some advantages that you could pick out that have uh, occur, occurred at certain times. I mean, no system is going to be com without completely without some advantages. But, you know, that's a different question from um, can we build a civilization on uh, enlightenment principles? And I just don't think you can. It's not it's not good enough. You need more than that. You need an ethos. You know, I was just talking to Dr. Steve Turley tonight in the, in the interview that we did about that. He was like. You know, one of the reasons that the West sees a lot of these other places like Russia as enemies, it goes much further than, uh, you know, just ideological disputes between East and West. It's more so what's the ethos of that culture? If the ethos of Russia, traditionally speaking, is orthodoxy, that's why it's a problem, because that's not the ethos of the West, which is for the last 500 years, you know, atomized enlightenment individualism, which is now becoming uh, socialism. So... Why, why is socialism bad, but enlightenment individualism good if you believe in a secular atheist enlightenment individualism? I can't figure out why one would be bad and one would be good at all. How do you have a justification for normativity? 
Right. There's no clear standard um, in liberal or enlightenment thinking. I totally get that. I I guess I will say the benefit that we do have from it is wealth creation and technological advancements. Um, Like, you know, we're talking on Twitter right now. Uh, Okay, but we don't know that that necessarily came because of the fact of these... uh, ideological revolutions in other words we don't know what think what society would have been like had we not had these tumultuous uh revolutions maybe maybe we would maybe it would have been better maybe we would have had better uh uh you know it's like the you know the man in the high castle like what would it be like if if uh you know some uh if tiny mustache man had won you know we don't know right so i don't buy into a lot of the sort of enlightenment polemics that Oh, we only have iPhones because of uh, you know Adam Smith or something like. We, we don't know that. That's that's a leap, maybe. But maybe it would have been better. Maybe it would have had like maybe it would have been flying around in Elon's space yacht if we had had monarchs. I mean, who knows? Well, I, I feel like the argument to that would just be to say we had almost you know two thousand years of that and we didn't get there, and then four to or three to two hundred years got us everything we have now technologically and wealth wise right or do you just not find that convincing at all uh, i can't recommend my paper um on the dangers of modernity and technology where i go into explore that the ancients did have the knowledge and techniques to advance technology but there were reasons why they didn't be on certain means and that's because of uh certain kind of ideological political and uh ultimately religious um ideas that they had that kept that stuff into check so i would probably argue it's not good what we technology itself is not bad but like um the advancements are made um might not (laughs) And the wealth is not necessarily a good thing. This again, like Jay's saying, this is just some type of enlightenment progressivism. That it's. I mean, what um, you consider an advancement bad, right? is and that's not the case at all. Because the primary concern is, does it aid in man's salvation and acquiring the virtues? Does that, Twitter? Does yeah, that's, that's why acquisition. A society's telos, what they see as the end goal of life, is going to condition what that society sees as the good. There's no such thing as a society that is neutral on the good that it makes up itself and or then or ex post facto figures out which is the good. So we're experimenting, I guess, now with that kind of society. And I mean, if all if this society ends up in a giant collapse, are people still gonna be arguing that it was better than if we had not had the revolutions uh, of the the 1700s, 1600s, and all that. I mean, these are all just, in my view, ar- bad arguments from silence, which just rest on a bunch of presuppositions, which we don't know. And again, a society is going to be organized around its its ultimate criteria, of what it considers the ultimate telos or the ultimate good. And the Enlightenment philosophy ultimately was about removing telos. It removed telos from the world. Then who sets telos? Individuals at that time. Well, what does that give way to? Socialism, technocrats, will to power sets the telos I was just of the society. Say libido dominandi, like this right. will to power. Should we should we advance our technology? The question of like why doesn't come because we can do it. I can will it, right? And this becomes uh, a dominating principle of like in our modern society that guides technology make it because we can make it there is no um checks and balance in terms of like jay said teleology or the spiritual advancement of man um we're as nietzsche said beyond good and evil now right okay yeah and jay dyer uh jay i know you're clued up on the amish question of course and uh i'm sure your position isn't to be amish um so would you agree with Father Ananias, his discerning principle of technology and these innovative systems are good so long as they somehow lead people to salvation? Is that the discerning principle here for these kinds of advancements that we have seen during the era of um, you know, enlightenment thinking and liberalism and things? Well, I mean, 
there there's not just one good. I mean, this, this, there are multiple goods in society. Society can have multiple goods. Yes. I think he's just making the point that the ultimate good of society is going to be its uh, organizing principle, its ethos, its where it's directed. And if there is no divine, if there is no transcendent, the societies who have that presupposition are not going to direct their telos to uh, the eschaton. They're going to direct everything to the eminent. Everything will be about the pragmatic and the here and the now. And that's really what's represented by the Enlightenment revolutions. It's a rejection of the notion of authority to some, some subordinating that to the notion of uh, pragmatism and power. And the what goes along with that, which we just covered in the philosophy course uh, over at uh, Tragedy and Hope at uh, Autonomy University, is the idea that... Um, now it becomes a situation where man and man does not discover, discover the truth and submit to the principles exterior to him. Man now imposes that and makes reality what it is. So far from uh, uh, the notion that we uh, have gotten away from enlightenment principles, we lit now live in the postmodern magical thinking world that is the end result of the enlightenment principles namely hume's psychologism kant's psychologism which leads us to this conclusion where what does jean paul sartre say he says essence does not precede existence he's talking about everything from the ancient and medieval world he says existence precedes essence that means i am not determined by anything there's no external rules powers, authorities, truths, metaphysical principles, epistemic principles, logic, laws. Any, I don't submit to any of those things. I determine those things. I and come first. And transgenderism. If you want to be whatever you want to be, will it to be? Um, that is the magical it. thinking. Yeah, that's what Terrence McKenna right. says. Okay. Terrence McKenna says okay. that postmodernism is magical thinking because it says that everything is a social construct because everything since human Kant is a social mental construct. There's no objective truths or principles that you're learning. You're constructing and calling them those things. And then also think about the switch in political thinking and like political philosophy with the enlightenment. I mean, even think about in terms of law for the ancients, what was law about law was within not again, individualism, um, wasn't defined in terms of the individual and and rights and things like this, but in the entire polis. And it was a structure such that it would enable and help and promote uh, the citizen to acquire virtues. Fast forward to the Enlightenment, and you get this kind of Hobbesian thinking. Yeah. Uh, everybody's just going to kill each other, right? It's a dog-eat-dog world, right? So you already have this kind of atomized individualistic thinking kind of will to power everybody's going to kill each other so then what happens is the enlightenment political thinkers um create this notion of law in terms of rights to keep people from killing each other i have a right to my life liberty um property right is a law talks about so they're all like negative rights well um, and keep in mind, too, yeah, there are, there's no positives there. It's all negative rights, negative liberty, as it's called in political philosophy. And Locke's tabula rasa uh, philosophy, which is influences and in which which is what David Hume picks up, which is what Kant agrees with, that's essentially the, the first move of denying any of these notions of the soul or of things or essences in things. All of those Enlightenment guys try to reduce everything to like one or two things existing, bodies and minds right body mind god right all of these enlightenment yeah. guys said that's all that exists there aren't natures in things anymore that's so crucial for understanding so if there aren't natures anymore then what are we studying you're studying matter in motion if you're studying matter in motion then things are just whatever we call them we're not learning a nature of a thing humans don't have natures you see what i'm saying it's the, the anti-essentialism is itself preparing the way for the total nihilistic will to power that the super state steps in and says, we will determine good and evil for you. We will determine life and death. We will determine meaning. We will determine all of that. Right. Like, this is basically just exactly how Caesar operated in Rome. They were, they were, he was a god to be worshipped. That's true, but even in the ancient and medieval world, even the philosophers who, well, actually, you could argue that uh, this, the meditations of uh, Marcus Aurelius 
Uh, they actually do kind of prepare the way for uh, the will to power. But even then, there wasn't as radical a notion of uh, dispensing with all metaphysics. Anyway, uh, great questions. We're going to move on if you don't have any more to, to say there. Yeah, I'm good. I don't want to okay. take any more time. That's fine. Father, great questions. Thank you, Jay. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Sir. Thank you. God bless you. Yeah, great questions. Jared. What's up, Jared? Hello there. Yo. Hey, Jay. It's Jared Seelum again. Uh, Have we talked before? So. You're cutting out, dog. versus Roman Catholicism. I wanted to come to you uh, more, with, more, more so with some questions just to just to start a dialogue. So I'm currently reading Eric Ibarra's book called The Papacy at the recommendation of a Roman Catholic scholar friend of mine. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm so, and, and I'm wanting your opinion on the historical mythological, methodological approach. He's apparently chosen this. I haven't, I've only read about two and a half chapters of it. So I, so I don't, I wouldn't, characterize this as the entirety of Eric Ibarra's position for sure but I'd just like to read you this passage of his okay um, I'm not, have you read this have you read this book no yes yeah, it's, it's, it's it's within the last year that it came, that it was released okay um, so uh, end of chapter two page 30 might it be the case that since the raw historical data presents a more widely diverse picture of the Christian church in reference to the papacy, that the debate only gets resolved from a mixture of finding the best average of what Christians believed in the first millennium, but also with a view looking at an a priority philosophical insight. Just what kind of an ecclesiology can sustain a unified, visible church, and is there sufficient evidence of that being held in and accepted by scripture and tradition again in reference to the papacy these questions get us closer to a resolution so that's the way he ends the chapter two um, okay I mean, uh, the next the next, the next hold one, on he, he, before yeah, you read that you next before you read that next quote are you aware that uh not too long ago post the publication of this book on twitter he claimed that he never made the argument that the papacy is a function of ensuring unity well, it seems well. Okay, see, so if he said that on Twitter, that's. But it, that's exactly what I understand that the Catechism of the Catholic Church says. Of course, he says. And by the way, Eric used to also say the very opposite of that. That he always, of course, he said that. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll look. I'll look here to confirm you. I, tr I, tr I trust you, but that's so. That's not his. So, as a function of unity, right? At the visible head of unity in the church, you're, you're claiming that Eric Ibarra does not has affirmed that he doesn't believe that yes on occasion okay well that's that's interesting that's not very catholic um well i mean it's like the very thing that every catholic apologist uh argues right i mean it's like catholic papacy apologetic 101 to argue this so the fact that he walked that back in uh on twitter was pretty funny we made a big deal about it i think i could probably find those let me see if i can scroll through and Fine. No, um, me, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not listening to you on to you on YouTube to just conserve bandwidth on my side. But okay. Uh, I'll look. I'll look. I'll look back. Uh, so just say the name and I'll. I'm trying to find the actual tweets. It's in my live stream. I did. I think uh, the one that's had about twenty thousand views about uh, Lofton. I think we fa we covered those uh, tweets one by one. But I'm looking right uh, now to scroll back and find the actual tweets to show everybody. So anyway, go ahead with your next point. Um. Yeah, the next point again is just this talking. There's a scene. So, so again, he's. Uh, in, yeah, sure. Can you close? Thank you. Can close the door. Excuse me. Uh, I found it. I found it. By the way, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, again, so in the chapter three, epistemological considerations. Uh, he also, again, he's just quoting directly from the Catechism, contradicting what you're saying essentially. Uh, that he says he's just. All these things. So, Vincent of, of Marin's, um, Vatican, Vatican Council de Verbum, all things that affirm the exact opposite of what you're saying. And which also points to the fact that the, 
living teaching office of the church has the task of authentically interpreting the word of God, whether written or handed on. Um, and, you know, I'm just having a lot of, I'm having trouble dissecting this in a way, you know, that tries to make I'm sure you are. <laughs> his argument co- coherent. I mean, I'm sure you, you have your own reasons for thinking that, but just looking at a book and anticipating what his approach is going to be, what for a question of settling the papacy and determining whether that's essential to the Christian faith, which is, you know, as someone that's investigating the church, I would say that would be a pretty good thing to figure out is the distinction between the Orthodox and the Catholics. How, what would your approach to uh, that question? Is the papacy necessary and is it present in it? And, and if so, how is it present in the first millennium of the church? How do you approach that? I mean, I know you've done lots of live streams on it, but if you could summarize that for me here. All right, so just real quick here, uh, I did find the tweets. Here's Ibarra saying, I have said many times that the machine for unity argument is nowhere the heart of what the, would prove the doctrine of the papacy. I've said this over and over and over. Whoever makes this argument anyway? Are you serious? I mean, this guy's... A, I, don't, I can't understand how people follow someone that's dense. And... Here he, he is. He says it's not the part of the argument. That doesn't mean it's part of. That doesn't mean it's not part of it, or that is. Okay. Well, again, I mean, let's see. Here is another quote. The point is rather different. You gave a display of getting things done without a pope. To whoever suggests that Rome is true because it is a machinery for unity is duped. Uh, he's arguing. Okay, that, that's that's what that's what you said. He said right there. That is his quote. I'm not saying he that, said that. That's his quote. It's on the screen. That's oh, okay. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll well, if you could leave, if you could leave that here, I'm having a little trouble finding his page on Twitter. But yeah, I'll look back to that. That's uh, that's quite something. But again, back to the question. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So, Eric Ibarra, and both noting his uh, his claim that the Pope or that the, magis- the living magisterium is essential for resolving any dispute that may be within scripture or within tradition. I mean, not that those things are, things are in conflict within themselves, but that, but that any external person asking a question. If that magisterium is essential, yet he claims that an authentication or a justification of the papacy can be achieved by looking at the historical record or something there that doesn't quite add up in my head. I mean, I know that from the Roman Catholic perspective, a living voice is necessary. And, a, and But there's a whole lot of things, things in that that I haven't quite figured out, from the or, one from the Orthodox side, and one how that would fit into the picture of achieving a, resu- a revolution and hopefully in the end a conversion to a true one holy Catholic apostolic church that is orthodox, if that's the case. What, what's your opinion on, on resolving this question in particular? Of the role of the papacy? I don't understand what, what exactly. Could you just boil down really quick what your question is? Uh, okay, yeah, sure. And in, in, one, in one or two sentences, what... So having cited Eric Ibarra in, in his claimed method for resolving the issue of the papacy or at least continuing the dialogue so the uh, and the method being the method being some being, kind of averaging with a church father quotes something like that is that what he was saying church church fathers quotes boots ecumenical councils given the context yeah but did, did he say it's something like, like averaging things. out the majority of the quotes like it's a math problem um that's that is what he said in in chapter two again i'll <laughs> I'll give the, I'll, I'll give the guy a little grace because I haven't read the whole book. But that is what he said in that quote. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I don't know how and on what basis averaging out quotes like a math problem would be some way to resolve this, or on what basis are we supposed to believe that that's the way we know the doctrine of the papacy? I mean, that's not very papal. I mean, in, if, in terms of a, a epistemic principle, shouldn't the papacy tell us what the doctrine of the papacy is? Right, but that's circular. Correct. So my point is that I don't understand how they don't avoid being circular 
and circularity is something that they never address because they're not, and I'm not trying to be mean, but they're just not good enough at epistemology to understand the basics as to why that's a problem in their system when they reject circular argumentation a, a, a wholesale. It's a classical foundationalist system. Vatican I says, uh, if you want to know the papacy is true, just add up and look at all the quotes on the basis of uh, the earliest days of the church fathers, and you'll see that it's true. That's an evidentialist model. And so Eric right. is being consistent with his evidentialist approach to things, but it's only as uh, so good as evidentialism is. What if evidentialism is not true? That's why, we, that's why we argue epistemology all the time, because if that goes, then their whole system goes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Anyway, no, I don't find this to be a very uh, sensible, coherent method at all. And I will put underneath this uh, chat right now uh, Eric's uh, quotes on this very point. Anything else? Um, I don't know. So, I mean, you, you, don't, you don't think that, that, that argument's valid? And you think, okay, so, you're, so you think the alternative methodology is to examine it from, I guess to examine the papal claim from an epistle standpoint as opposed I would to, start there because Eric's gonna start there. Okay. yeah because I mean it's not the only thing I don't mind going into the quotes and all that but the point is that because these people don't understand paradigm level systems they don't understand the critique that we make of their system they think as Eric said to me in our pseudo debate that you just stack up the quotes and see who has the biggest best number that's so stupid and naive to think that anything would work this way, especially when it comes to worldview and paradigm level systems. But they just don't know what we're talking about. I mean, when I debated Trent, he was completely lost as to what I was even arguing. So, of course, they're not going to understand that this is a that this is a debate about two different systems. It's not a debate about who can stack up more quotes of the church fathers in a quote mine uh, 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 battle. And now that's why I asked Eric, that's why I asked Eric, I said, I mean, what would it take for you to not believe in the papal system anymore? And he said, well, if there was a dogmatic contradiction, then it would mean that it's false. But you'll notice that it doesn't matter how many arguments and evidences you give showing dogmatic contradictions, they will always reinterpret the evidence to not actually be that. And so they involve themselves in immense amounts of casuistry to explain every example away. When we uh, point out Pachamama, oh, that's not actually a problem because Pachamama is a symbol of Mary. No, it's not. It's a human sacrifice deity. It has nothing to do with Mary. But Michael often just explains that away as, well, Pipe, Patrick, Francis isn't an, an apostate because that's just a symbol of Mary. Oh, well, then why did so many martyrs die in the first three centuries? They could have just said that these were symbols of the gods. Why is Aaron a bad guy for making a golden calf when he said it was a symbol for Yahweh? It's just a symbol for God. Okay, now, now there's, some, there's, there's, there's something embedded in, in, in that. I'm not that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm trying to get the hang of here. So what you have, so, so what appears you're indicating from the, Rome, the, the pattern of the Roman Catholic argument is to defend not only officially infallible or ex cathedra claims, but that certain actions of the Pope, as they are reflective of his... I mean, they don't claim that the Pope, you know, venerating or worshiping Pachamama in the St. Peter's Bolesca, which I saw... Um, I, I'm very much aware of this. That in itself wouldn't invalidate the papacy. Yes, it would. Because it, that is, in Catholic moral theology, an action of apostasy in their canon law, in their moral theology. That's an different. action of apostasy. Okay. Correct. Because in Catholic moral theology, there's different types of sins. Not every sin is equal. And so certain sins, inc they incur... Uh, ipso facto or latte sententiae excommunication. Let me give you an example. One of those is called abrasion. If you procure an abrasion with knowledge of your act in Roman Catholic moral uh, theology and canon law, you are automatically excommunicated. And in canon law, you're not able to take communion again. They don't enforce this, but you're not supposed to take communion until the bishop restores you to communion because you're automatically excommunicated. Guess what? Other sins incur the exact same penalty of latte sententiae excommunication. Ipso facto, apostasy, heresy, and schism. Those are the sins 
that immediately remove you from the body of Christ by their very nature. So no, committing adultery, uh, fornicating, those do not make you outside of the body of Christ in terms of the visible uh, canonical structure of the church. And so gotcha. that's their theology. That's the, that's what you have to understand is that if you read Mestici Corporis and if you read uh, uh, Satis Cognitum, those documents specify certain species of sins that incur certain specific penalties. And so that's why the action of apostasy on the part of the Pope is so important is because no, it would invalidate the Vatican I claims because Vatican I promises indefectibility as well as infallibility. So if Francis is now an apostate, and if his actions constitute apostasy, that would also mean, by the way, that all the other Vatican II popes who have done similar or the same actions also are apostate. You see how that undoes the whole system. That's why Lofton is perceptive enough to realize that he has to defend the actions themselves as not a problem. But what did the guy uh, an hour ago point out about Aaron? Was Aaron justified in saying that the golden calf is just a symbol of Yahweh? No. And the in scripture makes it perfectly clear by the punishment. It's, I mean, no, no, the punishment was given as a, for Aaron to not enter the promised land was given on another Absolutely. Occasion, and but... also keep in mind in Catholic theology that <clears throat> there's also a distinction they make in, uh, in their moral theology between private and public actions. And so for a public leader and a public figure to do a public action is all the more worse than if Benedict were privately or, or Francis were privately secretly worshiping Pachamama or some deity or something like that. That would be its own thing. We wouldn't know about that. But because it's a public act in their own canon law, their own moral theology attributes much more guilt to public actions because of the public scandal they cause. Ratzinger himself even criticized the Assisi meetings, which he himself participated in, as public scandal. That, those are technical mm. terms in their moral and canonical theology. I need to do some reading. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, what I would, yeah, I, 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 yes. Thank you for that. I this will this will be an on, this will be an ongoing thing, and perhaps I'll be able to resolve it sooner than later. Um, yeah, good, good question. I'll continue listening. Uh, Thanks for the th thanks for the answer to the question. I'll probably we'll hopefully uh, have another exchange. In, in sure. Yourself. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. Hop on anytime. Good questions there. Um, we'll see. We got a we got a full house. We got so many people here. Uh, let's go to we we got our regulars. I'm not trying to be mean to you, Fumples I just, and Garrett. I want to give some other people who have not uh, popped in uh, some time here. Uh, we'll go to you guys later. Chadia, what's up, Chadia? Hello. Yo. What's up? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. What's up, man? How you doing? A boomer tech is kicking in full speed here. Um, can you hear me? You're good, dude. Go ahead. All right. Go out and come back in. We'll try somebody else. Uh, Je Jedediah Marcel. What's up, dude? Unmute, bro. Oh, hey, can you hear me? Yeah, man. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Uh, Welcome. I had a quest two questions. Um, one for you and one for Father Deacon, if he's still here. Okay. Uh, I sort of apologize for this one because I know you've talked about it before. Um, I'm taking a philosophy of science class, which is just packed with, uh, you know, talking about stabby stabbies and global warming. Mm. Um, so I wanted to, and uh, evolution Are you kidding well. me? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, I know you've talked about this before, Jay, but... Mm -hmm. uh, you had sort of defeaters for their claims about the amount of erosion that went on, uh, the amount of erosion and the time frame of the Grand Canyon and rock formations and that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, it's that. So for whatever reason, my screen capture is not capturing the right thing. So uh, you, if you go to, let me see, 
the local news about a uh, mini Grand Canyon that opened up in Montana. So let's say I think it's K-Ron uh, mini Grand Canyon. Let me see if that pulls it up. <clears throat> it's pretty wild. And then there's other examples of uh, fossils that uh, go between uh, the so-called strata that are supposed to be millions of years of different. I think this is it. K-Ron News at 9. No, that's not it. I have it saved. I think it's Montana. I think I mentioned it in my book. Did you see Montana? I think so. It may not be. I mean, I mean, this is from like six years ago. I think you're right. Uh, Canyon opens you up. You and I talking about it. Like opened up overnight, and it freaked everybody out. Out, and they were like, "How could you? Ha this is supposed to take millions of years." Um. Can somebody in the chat, if you guys can find that, I'll try to find the link. I've got it saved uh, in my. There's also something about. There was some experiment with like the DDT fly or something like that that was oh, exposed it. to something, and, and according to phyletic gradualism, it would have taken like 30,000 years for it to evolve and adapt it's wyoming genetically and it happened within like a week or something like that so the article is uh mini canyon opens up in wyoming swallows part of the bighorn mountains so it's not montana it's wyoming uh look at that it's pretty wild now it's not as big as the grand canyon it was like a mini grand canyon it looks uh, really close to it and that, that opened up overnight so uh no it doesn't take millions of years for a grand canyon to form I will put the article in the chat, by the way, for the uh, people viewing. Yeah, you guys can see it there. So anyway, but uh, my screen capture is not working. It's like capturing the wrong thing. So I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, That's terrible to hear about your philosophy of science. I Today I started teaching my first class uh, philosophy of science, and we don't do that. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cringy at some points because they'll talk about how global warming is basically a certainty, and then they'll call everything else that they disagree with pseudoscience, and then they're talking about things that pretty much undercut everything that they're claiming is fact. So, well, I just got back from Europe, and I forgot what it's like to be in Europe. Um, I don't typically watch the news in in the states, other than maybe like the local channel. But everything in European news is climate change, climate, climate change, right wing national extremism, climate change. And, and I was like, <laughs> they're totally crazy over there for climate change, aren't they? Yeah. Ludicrous. There it is. So I don't know why. The specific so question it's... for, uh, for I, you, Father. I found it, by the way. There's the uh, article. You can see it. Photo mini Grand Canyon opens up. It's pretty awesome, actually. Look at it. So there okay, you go. awesome. Go ahead. Um, but the uh, question for you, Father Deacon, it was about um, basically how underdetermination of data um, relates to macro evolution and uh, some of the auxiliary assumptions that they that the their claims depend on, and then some of the Conf potential confounding variables that they would theoretically have to account for, but, you know, would potentially, you know, undermine all their claims, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so we were, it was really interesting. We were going over, like, some naive views of science that science is derived from facts and observations as if, and then we give the naive view of that and then deconstruct that, the author does too, um, as if it's just, just direct experience in which you build f facts, and facts are not truths, they're statements about observations, but then that presupposes, the author was really good, he was like almost doing precept, that presupposes a whole theory about perception, um, how you form 
And, you know, a statement isn't identical with the observation either. It's about and stuff. So there's always problems. But one of the things that they brought up concerning um, observation was the kind of gestaltian in the book they use like this staircase that I hadn't, I hadn't seen this one before. It's like going up or it's down and stuff like that. Just to illustrate that you could have the data out there, but you see it differently. So the idea that it's just a, a silly idea that <coughs> we could just look at the data and evidence that's objectively out there and um, formulate facts and facts will then um, will confirm our theory and stuff like that. So this is what Quine Duheim in a kind of more sophisticated way, you can't, I mean, in some sense, science is supposed to be derived from what? Empiricism, the empirical data out there. But then there's problems with that because it's never, the data is never going to confirm a theory. Like, in other words, um, it's underdetermined. I could use, I can come up with multiple theories that will all confirm, like match the, the observances. Does that make sense? So, yeah. in light Sorry, of that, on. I can't use, quote unquote, facts and observations to confirm theory, is the idea. Now, your question was in terms of macroevolution. Right. All right, so well, by, by the way, uh, yeah, possible. You, yeah, go ahead. you'll notice the fly geyser, as I show here. Uh, this is a classic example, too, um, of a calcite formation that uh, is a result of drilling from the 1910s, 1916. Uh, it's near Burning Man, and now it's this giant calcite formation, and it didn't take millions of years. It took 100 years, so... Quartz usually takes 10,000 years to develop. Oh, but this one didn't. Oh, yeah, see, you see even here they have to say, usually this takes 10,000 years, but magically in this case it didn't. No, well, maybe it doesn't take 10,000 years, <laughs> right? So the presupposition of the uh, age is built into the system is what is what you'll notice here. See this? Look at how they have to explain it away. Because th this only took like, you know, a few years to to develop certainly not 10,000 or a million or whatever. All right, go ahead. By the way, I just came up with this term when I was talking with Sarah from Foltz, Dr. Sarah from Foltz about this, all of this stuff, you know what it is concerning science, these scientific theories, because they want to pretend like the naive view, it's just the facts. Just look at the observations. How can you deny it? All of science is abs abstractionalism. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually removed from and this comes up later in philosophy of science the clash between what Sellers calls the manifest image and the scientific image so in one sense science doesn't even match the common sense it really is an abstractionism that's often kind of times contrary to um, what we observe. Yeah, exactly. Now, but yet, but yet, it's supposed to be, be uh, brute, factual observation, simple observation, which is just naive when it comes to you know epistemic theories and content. It's as if reality isn't theory laden. We know that it is. Uh, I'm not trying to cut you off, but uh, we're going to have to move through some more questions. Is there anything else, Jedediah? It was a great question. Yeah, thanks. Um, nothing that wouldn't take a lot longer. So I'll let you guys, guys get on with it. I uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, good questions. <clears throat> and I'm going to sell my um, philosophy of science lectures for... $1 million. $1 million, that's right. Uh, order of things. What's up, dude? <clears throat> uh... 
I'm you, dude. By by the way, that's a great name. I like your handle for her things. Hello. Yes, sir. What's up, man? Oh, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my quick question. I do want to make a comment regarding judges and the king. I think the king. They already had a king. I think that was the, and the king was God, and they wanted to rule themselves and they have their own king. I think that was, I think that's a significant point. Well, then why does it say in Judges there was no king in Israel in those days and everyone did what was right in their own eyes? Well, I'm not saying that the period of Judges was perfect by any means. Well, um, what does that phrase mean? That's that. That's a negative. What? I, I think it's a negative phrase. Okay. What meaning? What? Well, uh, let's say. I mean, we're like at this phase right now where everybody does whatever they want. So, it'd be similar to let's say right now. And I would also say that Jesus, when he talks about the parable of the tenant, that's the point when God gave his um what do you call it relax breathe so, <laughs> so the microphone's very close um that's the point when he gave his uh the vine right to the tenants what and <clears throat> i think that that's the point when god gave his vine to the tenants and the tenants were kings and and jesus came to collect so the, the point when in that parable the, the tenants are kings i think so i don't know what's the so. interpretation I, of I, that i don't know what you're talking about i mean why would you think that it's kings there well whoever was managing the people well it's yeah you could say the rulers okay okay yeah the pharisees so, the religious and the the state authority okay <clears throat> Uh, and just one more point about state. I think that the origin of the state is really with uh, Mark of Cain. It's uh, it's a it's it's an idea. No, of... the state is not the Mark of Cain. It's God gives Manoah the right to put people to death. That's the state. Does he not? Is it well? Okay. So the thought is that it's it's an instrument of vengeance. To does to... God give Noah the right to exert the death penalty or not? Yeah, he does. Okay, so is that the state well, or not, not? Yeah. Well, I, the Bible, I think, is it's a fantastic book. I think. Okay, all right. The, We're not, that's enough. Sorry, dude. Uh, you're too breathy. Go get your breath, dude. Relax. I don't know if you came in from jogging. Um, Chidea, do you want to try again? That's the breath of life, right? You need some of that. You need some of that breath of life of Stanley. Stanley got that breath of life. Go get your, go catch your breath, man, and come back when you got your energy. Chadia, unmute, bro. <sighs> Augustine Keller. By the way, if you guys want to chat, request to speak, I give you the mic, you unmute yourself. And catch your breath, man. <laughs> Go get the breath of life in ya. Hello? Yes, sir. What's up? Hey, so um, I have a question regarding conciliar fundamentalism and reconciling differences in the uh, church fathers. So I've been listening to Craig Chirulia a lot lately and reading his blog posts. And I'm sorry. He talked about... What? I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you've been listening to Craig for this stuff. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, um, and he was talking about conciliar fundamentalism, how the uh, church fathers would consider the minutes of the ecumenical councils and extra documents attached later onto them as um, 100% authoritative, not just the canons and decrees. Yeah, I know. C and Craig, then, Craig is a goober. I don't know what to tell you. Oh, oh really? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, I'll stop watching his stuff then. Otherwise, then, um, well, what would you say about uh, Augustine? Do you think there's a way to read him and not have him be a Neoplatonist? Because I was looking at some of his stuff. No. And no, of course not. So 
When St. Photius says that we cover the errors of our fathers, that doesn't mean we lie and act like they didn't make errors. And so Craig is just not in a position to comment on this. And the idea that we would go back and act like Augustine, Augustine doesn't teach these things is ridiculous. And Craig has no philosophical training, has no academic training to my knowledge. I don't know why Craig feels like he's competent to dismiss the scholarship around uh, Augustinian thinking, which he says, I don't need Augustinian scholars. I just go read them myself. This whole attitude of, I just read that stack up the church fathers is pro it's Protestant. He's promoting a Protestant methodology that's no different than Sola Scriptura. It's just the stack up the quotes of the church fathers, and that's how we know what's the, what the theology is. But as we pointed out, Craig, in his uh, more recent posts, uh, has no place or no understanding, no explanation for Augustine's denial of recapitulation. And he never talks about this. He never mentions it because it undercuts his whole Augustinian project. Oh, wow. All right, that makes, so we that all, makes a bit more sense. Augustine does not teach recapitulation. If you don't believe in recapitulation, you cannot have Orthodox Christology. He doesn't even know that Augustine has Christological errors. And yeah, I'm I, I get angry about this because these are people that used to be in the Discord that we tried to talk to for years, and they don't listen, and they just go off on their own projects. And they won't listen. And it doesn't matter how many times you show them that they're wrong, they come up with these dumb ideas that, oh, the church fathers never made mistakes, which is verifiably false. It makes us look dumb. Roman Catholic theologians and scholars should laugh at that because it makes us look silly. So, no, I don't support Craig at all, and we tried for years to talk to Craig. And I don't support Prime or any other people that listen to these people who aren't f f competent to talk about this stuff. Yeah, I was wonder. I, I had thought that maybe he wasn't legit because I hadn't seen you collaborate. He's with just him at all. he's just immature. And if he had if he had listened, we would have collaborated with him. But no, he decided to go in a different direction and come up with sola patristica, which is just his own Protestant uh, methodology. And he, again, uh, Craig, does Augustine teach recapitulation? No, he doesn't. That's fundamental to uh, Orthodox Christology. So there you go. So you can't rehabilitate and re revise Augustine because he made that mistake. And you can't make his Christology Orthodox because of his predestinarianism. He says Jesus is a predestined man. That's not Orthodox Christology. And Craig doesn't have a consistent understanding. Craig thinks and tries to argue that Augustine teaches the essence energy. Thinking, no, he doesn't. It's just silly, and I'm tired of uh, having to deal with these people who go and confuse a bunch of other people, and then now we have to do all this uh, cleaning up the mistakes and, the, and the, the mess that's created from these people. So that's why it gets me so frustrated. I don't know, Father Deacon, if you want to comment on that, if you have anything to say with that about that. People say, oh, you're just being mean. No, you don't know about the five years of backstory of trying to talk to this guy. Yes, correct. <laughs> I'll take it, I guess. Um, it's nothing personal with Craig. I don't have any personal dislike. or per It's only about the theological things that Craig won't be corrected on, won't be flexible on, and pushing dumb ideas like the church fathers never made mistakes and the Holy Spirit inspired every single uh, thing at a council. It's just silly. I mean, does he not understand that the church fathers have conflicting canons of Scripture? Okay, so then they they weren't all right about everything. They got things wrong. Augustine, what's up? Uh, I, I think I uh, my connection went out, but yeah, that makes a lot more sense. I thought that was kind of a silly view. That's why I wanted to ask you about it. Yeah, it is silly, but you know, Craig's whatever. Craig has, uh, according to his own admission, doesn't need uh, philosophers and academics. He just needs the church fathers. If we just need the church fathers, then we don't need you. Fumples. Well, uh, before you go, Fumples, Father Deacon, could you speak to, uh, I'm not trying to stir up drama, but could you speak to this attitude of people who will say things like, because other people do it too, we don't need uh, philosophy and academics or any of this stuff. All I need is me and the church fathers, and I'm more holy and pious than the people who do philosophy and academic stuff because it's just me repeating the church fathers. That's, the, that's how you know the doctrines. What's wrong with that approach? Well, Dr. David Bradshaw and I just talked about this. It's modern, 
um, and it's kind of a papist and Protestant mentality. Yeah, and the people to, saying this are all converts from Protestantism. It's to take, and this is why it's related to why it leads to heresy, because it's a heretical attitude, because heresy is etymology to choice, to pick, to choose to pick a part and absolutize it as if it's the whole, um, is something that we see both in Roman Catholicism and Protestantism, and then you get this attitude with certain people um, in orthodoxy. We're a whole of many different parts. And so, and one many beautiful parts. That includes liturgy, that includes chanting. It even includes all the beautiful roles of the women and cooks, um, the apologists, the, you know, the philosophers, those who defend the faith, those who study, um, those who understand canon law. We all form part of this organic whole that's a family. So what do you think if somebody picks out, all I need is cooking in the Orthodox Church and everything else is is dumb. That's the only way that to God. It's it's the spirit of heresy. And, the... and it's just contrary to the whole history of the church. When we look at the fathers, nobody's saying like, look, you've got to be a cook to be orthodox, or you've got to do philosophy or apologetics. Nobody's saying that. But to diss it and and reject it and turn away from it that it's not part of your family and, and, and part of you whether you're you know qualified to do it and engaged in it um, is a heretical spirit and it leads to exactly what this diabolical division everybody else is wrong um, I'm the last I'm 22 years last. old I've read the canons I've read a bunch of English translations of Augustine and I will tell everybody on Twitter and YouTube how everybody else is wrong but I'm right I mean think about do you guys ever remember reading um, Elder Thaddeus his book Thoughts Determine Our Lives and he has a story about a monk and uh, an angelic being visits him and t- tells him you know you're just devoting all this time to prayer um you know you could really be somebody you should you know what why don't you let me your angelic being take care of uh the prayers and then you can just read books and become learned and he eventually goes and tells one of the elders this and he says wait what (laughs) first of all you're talking to an angelic being that told you to stop praying and to read books well, notice it's something similar here, right? All you need to do, all that's important is you. Everybody else is wrong. Why don't you just, who says stuff like that? There's only one type of beings that kind of give them. I mean, it should be really clear, right? I'm the last one. I'm the holy one. I can't trust anybody. I'm all by myself. Here I am. Um, here I stand, I can do no more but interpret the fathers by myself. <laughs> to make a Luther reference. <laughs> yeah, Luther. Go ahead, Fumples. Here I stand. It's demonic. It's total prelist. Go ahead, Fumples. Okay, nice to be back here. Nice to see you and talk to you again. But uh, uh, I'm just here for just a second. I'm going to be out of your hair in just a minute. I'm just here because this I want to Donegal clarify something friend. with Christology. Okay. Oh, no, I know I don't live in Donegal. I've been uh, Carrick Fergus. It's near Belfast, okay. Northern Ireland. Yeah, okay. Forgive me. Yes, no. Sorry. Anyway, so he, I, I'm in this group chat right now that I got added to a couple of weeks ago and to say the least it's fun but there's an indian guy in there who's oriental orthodox so he believes in monophysite christology hang on hang on hang on hang on i'll I'll quiet down in a minute hang on and he basically said that uh monophysitism is fine 
And I just wanted to clarify, do we believe that it's it's one divine nature and another human nature, right? Yeah, if you look at the two letters of Cyril to Six Census, uh, he admits even after the incarnation and, and, and resurrection, two natures. Um, so, yeah, we believe that the two natures come together in a real union and there is a real deification of the human nature by the uh, divine energies, but they do not cease to be what they were. They retain their properties. The created nature retains its uh, created properties. The uncreated divinity retains its uncreated properties. And even though there's a communicatio idiomatum, as St. Cyril says, they don't cease to be what they were, uh, even though they exist in a new mode of being, namely in hypostatic, in the uh, person of the Logos. So they retain their nature, even though there's a true union. And this is why it ends up by the Sixth Council, if you read uh, St. Maximus's book, disputations with purists it becomes ultimately a debate of the two wills and the two energies and so that's why uh, we don't accept their earlier christology which is hinging basically basically on the phrase mia fusis which was cyril's earlier phrase and then later he qualifies that and says yeah but that doesn't mean that there's not still two distinct natures retaining their properties uh, and so the fifth council was called to resolve this it's called uh, it's the it's a reunion council. If you read uh, uh, the Vesha book, uh, just Saint Justinian and the the Christology of the Fifth Council, it's a it's a great treatise on um, how the theology got kind of hashed out. But then the problem with the the East the, or the Orientals and the Coptics was that they have a different uh, list of saints, right? So <clears throat> we can't say that uh, Severus is a saint. Um, but it's true that Chalcedon uh, left things open. Chalcedon wasn't good enough. And so for us, the fifth council was necessary to explain that the fourth council, Chalcedon, has to be read, quote, in a neo kyrillian way. You have to read Chalcedon in a Kyrillian way so that it doesn't give place to Nestorianism. And that was intended to give uh, credence to the objections of the Coptics and the Monophysites. Uh, and then the debate shifts, as we said, at the sixth council over whether there's two wills and two energies in Christ. Unfortunately, a lot of their theology doesn't have a, a very clear explanation of the essence energy distinction. And so that's why it's not really, it's hard to get beyond that point with them, but that's, that's what it hinges on. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Uh, yeah. I'm great questions. I'm sorry. Uh, you can ask again. I, I, didn't, I thought you were done. I'm sorry. I, I hit the button too soon. Uh, just request again, Fumples, and I'll bring you back. Uh, Steven, what's up, buddy? Can you hear me? Hey, now I can hear you. Um, hey, Jay, I got a question uh, about uh, a typological prophetic fulfillment. One of the things that I love uh, about the Bible is the the fulfillment of prophecy through typology and right. I was wondering if there's any saint who talked about um, the splitting of the of the kingdoms in the Old Testament whether that has any prophetic fulfillment in the the schism in the church or whether more broadly whether there's any uh, prophetic typology in the in the history of the church yeah, so this is a, t uh, a thing that's popular amongst trad cats. The trad cats love to t make this into some sort of arbitrary typology between um, Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy splitting uh, as some kind of type that occurred. It's odd because uh, if you were going to make that into a typology of the age of the church, the irony is that uh, the big numbers are with the apostates. <laughs> so they, it doesn't really fit their model, but they'll, they'll say, oh, but... Uh, it is predicted in, in the in the northern tribes that splitting. Oh, yeah, but the southern tribe of Israel is the uh, smaller, truly orthodox Israelites, right? So the analogy that they try to use it for doesn't even make sense in their system. But they try to use it. A lot of trad cats and SSPX people try to use that as, oh, it's a type of the schism between the orthodox and the Roman. No, I mean, maybe there's some loose connection there, but it wouldn't fit their model of the numbers is what proves their church. Um, I don't know of any saints that use that as a typology or uh, some sort of imagery. My guess would be that if it's anywhere, it's probably in post-Reformation or post-Schism Roman uh, or Jesuit theology, because sometimes they would try to appropriate that kind of stuff for apologetic reasons. 
Uh, but no, I'm not aware of any Orthodox saints or theologians that appropriate that typology. Can you hear me? I guess we he dropped out. Feel free to come back if you uh, want to extrapolate on that. Uh, go ahead. You you popped out for a second. I guess you got a bad connection where you are, but uh, Petra Garde or or Stephen, whoever, either one. Uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, thanks for that answer. Um, yeah, I guess the other the follow up is: is there any any prophetic fulfillment in the life of or the history of the church that you know of um, that any saint has talked about? Um, I guess. I mean, would you see that as as far as the schism and and the Old Testament dealing, would you find that a valid argument that the Orthodox is representing, you know, the tribe of Judah? I just think it would be really speculative. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it's possible because I think there's a degree to which, um, even within the life and the experience of the church, the church itself even learns new things over time out of the well of the scriptures. So for example, a lot of the saints say that as we get closer to the end, books like the book of revelation will make more sense to the church so it's always possible that the church can realize a new nugget or gem within the scriptures like that i just wouldn't put too much stock into the specific schism in uh the the, the kingdom of israel because uh it's just it, to me it would be a little too speculative to say for sure gotcha okay cool thank you that's it yeah that's a good question i've wondered about that it's just uh you know, when the trad cat's appropriated, it doesn't really make sense with their model. <laughs> but Petra Garde, what's up, dude? Hey, man. How's it going? Great. How are you? Okay. I'm a Protestant Orthodox inquirer. Uh, I've attended a divine liturgy. I'm still checking things out, you know, trying to make sure that I'm not just jumping into something because it's based in trad, but that I actually believe it. Well, good. You know, That's good that reasons. Stuff. Yeah. So what stereotypes can I look forward to embodying as an Orthodox inquirer? Like what, what stereotypical jokes can be made about an Orthodox inquirer or what stereotypes should I look to avoid and not embody? Uh, I would just recommend um, going to all the churches that are around you that you have access to, uh, not relying on one type of jurisdiction or even relying on the fact that, oh, well, you know, this church is all in English, but this church is a bunch of ethnic people because you might have a, a more Bayes priest at the church that is, you know, doing Slavic or whatever. And you may not. You may have a bad situation there that's or a better fit somewhere else. So uh, don't arbitrarily pick it just on the basis of uh, jurisdictions. Just pick it on the basis of the, of the actual people and the priests at that church. Um, I can't, I mean, there's going to be a lot of uh, don't, don't think that, oh, now that I'm Orthodox, it's like some kind of green pastures and there won't be problems. I mean, you're going to have problems with the people in the church. You're going to disagree with the priest. You're going to have disagreements with other people in the church. They're going to have, there's going to be drunk. I mean, you're going to have the same problems that you find in other places. It's just maybe a different set of problems than what you find in the Protestant and Roman Catholic world. But uh, don't, you know, don't, don't have unrealistic expectations that, oh, this is, there's not going to be any problems when I come here. Uh, let's see. Luke Monet. What's up, dude? I'm going to read some super chats, too. First super chat before we go to Luke is gen genitals clutch. Can you mute just for a second, Luke? Luke, can you mute for a sec? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Can you mute for a sec? Hey, Jay. Yeah. Oh. Just for a sec. Yeah, it's loud in the background. Genitals clutch, $1. That is uh, something I don't want anyone. No one can clutch my genitals period, not even me. The question of grounding is orthogonal to the question of whether normative ethics are logically consistent. Yes, that is a classic vegan argument that is so awesome that it's actually nonsensical. Lizard $5. You've answered me on Twitter spaces twice, but my tech keeps going out. Apologies on my end. If universals are created and not uncreated energies, then the number three, okay, again, God is not equated to the number three. Okay, multiplicity and unity would arise from God. And it's not, the statement is not that 
universals and numbers are only created. They are patterned on uncreated things in the divine mind. So the Logi are the patterns for the universals and the numbers and everything that comes to be. So the number seven has an uncreated element to it, which is in the divine mind, and a created pattern that comes to be in the created order. It's a both and, not an either or. Kasi, $10. Great work. Thank you for helping me come to orthodoxy and not pretending that you're running a ministry. This is not a ministry. I do not give you uh, spiritual advice. We do not tell ortho bros to go on campaigns and become uh, the, the elders of Twitter. In fact, many of the ortho, bro, ortho bros that hate me and are going crazy is precisely because I tell them to shut up and they don't know what they're talking about. They shouldn't be giving people public advice and they don't like that and they're full of pride and pre -lust. So uh, I we do the exact opposite of that and people on Twitter just lie every day and say that I'm trying to lead some crusade or that I'm leading some group of ortho bros and telling them what to do. No, I'm not. We consistently tell people to go to the clergy and we've done that for years and the Discord has clergy in it. So that is just simply not true. And so thank you, Kasi. I am not I am not your preacher. I'm not your minister. I'm not your spiritual father. I'm not a guru. I'm not the person that you go to for these things. If you want to talk about philosophical and academic, geopolitical, news, factual, philosophical issues, we can talk about that. But I'm not your uh, spiritual father. And do not expect me to be that. AK, what are your thoughts on dating and premarital sex? I mean, I think ideally it would be great if we had uh, situations like... Um, uh, what's it called? I just went blank. Courtship and all that. Sure, that that would be ideal. And I think a lot of people in churches try to to set that up and foster that. That's much more healthy. I mean, a lot of people don't have access to that. I mean, it's not inherently wrong to date people. I mean, we can't be Puritans when we we live in this completely crazy culture. Um, premarital sex. Uh, I don't think you should uh, engage in that. It causes problems. Uh, it's not the end of the world if you have. A lot of people have. Go see Arizona $5. Do more impressions of dopey Protestants. Well, uh, there will be many of those to come. We've done many uh, dopey Protestant impressions. Somebody said, well, will he go after Gavin Ortland? Uh, the first hour was responding to that. So go back and watch that. Um, AIDS McGillicuddy. That's a nice name. 50 bucks. You did a great job on Timcast. Do you think Eric Ibarra has an icon of the Golden Corral? I've heard that he has an icon of the chocolate fountain in the Golden Corral. Thank you for that. 50 bucks, though. AIDS. Genghis, $10. Love you, Jay. Love you, too, Genghis. You're my con. Philip and Edenhorn, $3. I would have spent more, but we Western Euro pores have to go full renewable energy due to the diminished dinosaur juice oil and the evil nuclear plants. God bless you, hermano. Thank you, Philip Edenhorn. De dust to Blepe, $5. Your appearance on the Timcast was great. Thank you. I'm glad everybody liked it. I uh, was reading the comments. I was kind of blown away and surprised at how, uh, how many people in the comments were like, oh, he's the best, but have him back. That, that really humbled by that. That really touched me. I was touched by an angel like Michael Landon. I was uh, going on, when Ian was going on about Stone Ape Theory, I was hoping that you would take a jab at it. Well, <clears throat> things on that show move so fast that you can't really pick one topic and hone in on it. And as they explain, when you get to the studio, they're like, look, and I already knew this going into it, but it, it's not an interview show. <clears throat> it's a news commentary show. And they're like, you can bring, you know, your takes, your hot takes your hot pancake take, but it's not an interview show. So, you know, it's just kind of like a machine gun, bah, 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 go through the topics show. Uh, maybe down the road, we can have uh, another philosophical dis discussion in the first hour. When I got there uh, and when you go into the studio there before they start the show, <clears throat> Ian and I had a, a really good conversation about philosophy and philosophical ideas. And he seemed very interested and he definitely wanted to have future conversations. I think Tim did too, and Luke as well. So hopefully they'll invite me back down the road. Orthodox Imperium Rising, $50. Thank you. I recently found out that St. Petersburg Academy was founded as a consequence of Leibniz and P Peter collaborating. Interesting. I didn't know that. There's a, 
good and bad. Actually, Leibniz has some pretty good arguments. His his argument for the eternality of truth is a, a, a good argument. I would I would use I've used that argument before in, in debates. So there's some good things in Leibniz. He's got some other kind of weird uh, out there things. But you know, Leibniz is this weird figure that was in between Roman Catholics and Protestants. So he didn't really maybe know much about Orthodox theology, but he seemed to have been wanting to try to have something in between, which ironically is kind of what Orthodoxy has. And there's definitely areas I would criticize about Leibniz. But I think uh, that uh, in terms of apologetics, there's actually areas that we can appropriate uh, Leibniz, particularly the eternality of truth, which I think is a good argument. It seems like there would be geopolitical ramifications given the history of Leibniz and the betrayal of Russia. Uh, I'm not sure you'd have to f fill that out more. Or are you saying that because Peter was typically conceived of as kind of a bad guy that Leibniz contributed to that? Uh I don't know. You'd have to fill that out for me more. I don't know. I'm not saying that's not true. I just don't know. Rolf Stakes, $5. So glad to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. Christ in our midst. My Roman Catholic relative. <clears throat> my throat is getting dry. My Roman Catholic relative was listening to a Roman Catholic priest on YouTube the other day. The priest said that it was drop, name dropping Taylor Marshall. It's crazy to believe that Lofton... Taylor Marshall and Ibarra are the powerhouses of Roman Catholic theology. You know, actually, I don't mind that because um, when they find what we have and they see how much deeper and more intense, more real, uh, more nuanced and charitable, nuanced and charitable we are, then they find out that that stuff is like uh, a mile wide and a, an inch deep and we are a mile wide and a mile deep. Anonymous, $3. St. John Chrysostom sound a lot like a religious socialist. It's not socialism. It's just, you know, people in an imperium. So it seems that he was opposed to aristocracy. Uh, I think he's opposed to uh, a corrupt aristocracy, not hierarchy and aristocracy. He's a member of a, of a aristocratic branch of society, the hierarchy. He is at one of the, he's at the number two post in all Christendom. So his preaching against the sins of those positions is not the same thing as the positions themselves being wrong. At the same time, he never criticized the poo, the Pope. I don't know what you mean. Why would he criticize the Pope if the Pope was Orthodox at that time? <clears throat> and the reason that he was critical of the authority structure in Constantinople was that the Empress imprisoned him. Wrongly. J. Mel, $40. <clears throat> it was rare to find a theological history blend with your philosophical history. The course is tremendous. Thank you. Yes, I want to remind you guys, if you want access to the philosophy course, you see J. Mel there telling you that it was awesome. Thank you so much, J. Mel. I'm glad you enjoyed it. You can get the course in the show description over at Autonomy Agora uh, Marketplace, Autonomy University. It's right there. Check that out. Oops. And uh, it is uh, worth the money. So, you know, you can get uh, tutoring. You can get the do-it-yourself option. But the course is for sale. We have uh, sold a good amount already, I'm happy to say. Um, Josh told me the, the sales the other day. So I'm happy to say that we have, I'm not going to say how many, but we sold a good amount for the first uh, week or two that it's been on sale, week and a half. So uh, there you have a testimony of JML right there telling you that it's a, a unique, amazing blend that is not what you're going to get in the community college. Some dude on YouTube comments was like, this is about the same cost as community college, you're a liar. If you think that the quality of what I would give you is the same as a community college professor, then go to community college, dude. Why are you even in my sh chat? Dude, go do that. I want to add to, we will be live in a five hour event right here in Austin. Me and Jamie and BG Cumby. BG's going to do his own comedy set for 40 minutes. He assures you that it will be uh, lame and that he will phone it in. That was his assurance. He says that you will be not getting what you paid for and that BG Cumby can assure you of that, that you will be disappointed. But you will have a fun disappointment, he says when you go and watch him phone it in. So uh, that's BG style. I hope you understand that's quote comedy. 
So you will be getting what you pay for, even though you won't be getting what you pay for. Do you see? Do you see the? Do you see what I did there? It's called comedy. C O M E D Y. Go look it up. Google that. B G is going to be being funny, quote unquote, by phoning it in for forty five minutes. Then you get me. No, actually, you get me first. I don't remember how we set it up, but I will be phoning it in and trying to be funny very hard for 30, 45 minutes. Then Jamie will give her talk on Hollywood, esoteric, all-seeing AI, which is great. She goes deep into the symbolism and the history of Hollywood esotericism. She does an hour and a half talk. I do an hour and a half talk on my new book. Look at this. We get to use this fancy book cam again. I love doing this. Look at this. Push these little buttons here. Woo! My new book, Meta Narratives. I give an hour and a half impassioned Zizek style snorting, sweating frenzy. I foam at the mouth like Zizek. This is the religious meta narratives of the philosophy and the symbolism. And I snort the coke live on stage from the bosoms of the hookers, just like Zizek, for your entertainment pleasures. No, uh, no one else gives you this. Live on stage. <laughs> Lecturing from this philosophy text that I put out. You're welcome. You're welcome. That was a free Zizek. You understand you just got that free? And then we do open Q&A. Then we do book signing and chilling and why have you not bought tickets february 11th austin texas guys too many of you people out there are soy men i'm seeing a lot of soy men and i'm not happy i want to see this i want to see you getting this daily i want to see you upping your toxic masculinity points because that's what you should be doing if you're a lady out there Get you some of the Sheila legit. Stop freaking out and having breakdowns and whatever you're doing. Get calm. Get collected. Get calm, cool, and collected. Get some of this Irish moss, ladies. That stuff's good for you. I promise you. Get some of that Tomcat Elite if you're a dude out there. If you're suffering from soy malinity and you want to be a, a, a purveyor of, you want to be exuding toxic masculinity get you some tonkat ali tonkat 100 is proven in peer-reviewed studies to boost testosterone it really does you saw me today saying i want to fight some nerd in the creator clash you know why i said that because i was ramped up i was i was boosted up from that tonkat ali i took today i'm out here running off at the mouth I'm out here spitting game, trying to fight men on YouTube. I'm so amped up from that Tom Lee. That's what it does to you. And guess what? I'll probably get beat up. I don't even care. Because if I'm on Tom Lee, dude, I'm not even going to feel it. But I am going to get up toxic masculinity points just from being, entering into that octagon. Just from getting in that ring. I Just stepping in the ring, I'm boosted at least 30 toxic masculinity points right there. Because my life is a role-playing game. And right now we're winning it via the magical potions known as chalk.com. Imagine your life is a role-playing game. You're upping, you got a little bar over here, right here, toxic masculinity points, it's going down, and then it gets negative, you start turning into a soy man. You start going like this. Making these dumb faces. You start buying Funko Pops. I got a little surprise for you. We do something... Gallagher-esque in my live show to the Funko Pop. You understand what I'm saying? It's a ritual. You will be initiated into toxic masculinity when we engage in something Gallagher-esque with those Funko Pops in my in my live show. Not only that, the live shows give out free Tom Catalese, which are like $30 a bottle. So there you go. Head on over to chalk.com. Use the promo code J50 to get 50% off. If you don't want to keep putting in the information every month, which is annoying, then head on over there and use the promo code J60LIFE. 
J60LIFE for the you slow boys that can't spell. It's not LYFE like Stanley thinks with the breath of life. We don't spell it with no Y, ma. To spell it with a Y is racist. <laughs> Funko stomping. Funko pop. Funko stomp. It's a dance I do. Live on stage. I do the Funko stomp. Do the Funko stomp. Do the Funko stomp. Do the, do the, do the Funko stomp. Hit like and share. By the way, Chad nerds. Uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, J60 LIFE, 60 percent off. Go get that. Use that promo code. Uh, support Richard. Support him. Uh, follow him on Grand Theft World. Uh, I was just on Grand Theft World. Seven hour podcast. I was on for two hours. I think hour and a half, two hours. We went deep, homeboy, to use the phraseology of Sam Tripoli. Dude, dude. We went deep, homeboy. We really did. Go watch that episode, and I think you're going to understand why Grand Theft World is such a great geopolitical breakdown, big picture podcast. You know, Tim Tim Cass, these kinds of shows are great to give you the news, and what Richard does is says he takes that those news podcasts, condenses them, and says, let me give you the highlights, and let's get the big picture. And that's why I like Grand Theft World so much. So many other great things over uh, at uh, Autonomy University. Go check that out as well. I think we have a link in the show description. Um, I'm sorry for all of that. You're rambling there. Uh, Luke, did you want to uh, step up to the plate? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, well, let me just give it just a little bit of background. Um, over the past six months or so, when I came out of just some bad stuff, I ended up getting started i started to flirt pretty hard with uh reformed theology and specifically doug wilson until um kyle in- inevitably pointed me to you and you pointed me to orthodoxy so specifically i was just kind of wondering a if you were going to do maybe a longer stream or a video about the more reformed the reformed flavor of doug wilson or just talk about him in any longer sense than just individual references well, I mean, we have done uh, multiple extensive breakdowns of Reformed and Calvinist theology, at least probably eight hours of streams, strictly just breaking down Reformed theology. So I don't think that Doug Wilson really offers anything that would be that would re- re- require a specific response. I mean, if, if I mean, so we did uh, four hours breaking down Reformed stuff with Sam Shamoon. I did two hours on top of that breaking down reform stuff with uh, uh, Kotel, uh, David, pa- Patrick David Harry. And then I did another two, four hour podcasts on my own, breaking down Calvinistic reformed and Protestant theology on my channel. So, I mean, how, it, like, why does, the, I'm not dissing you or, re, or, or, or criticizing you, but why would Doug Wilson require like another, I mean, if, if those, He's in the classical Protestant tradition, making up his own denomination. So, like, why would he require his own thing? I guess what you said when you said he um, kind of made up his own Protestant denomination, that's sort of what I'm curious about, because I haven't been in this long enough to be able to really discern well. So I'm kind of just trying to figure out what it was I was listening to the past year or so. That's Mm -hmm. significantly different or, say, dare say controversial in the sort of wider sense of Christendom. Okay. Yeah. I think I know what you're, what you're saying. You're uh, like, like what specifically is up with, you know, Doug Wilson and, uh, you know, Moscow, Idaho and federal vision and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I know he did, he did a, um, piece on NBC where they came to him and that got, that seemed to get his name out there. I just saw that actually today in the feed. Uh, I didn't watch the thing, but I saw that that came up in the feed. Yeah. Well, so uh, yeah. I mean, to, to to be more specific, and let me see if I can make this pop up here. Okay, so uh, right here is a two-hour deconstruction. Uh, is it two hours? How long? Yeah, two and a half-hour deconstruction of Reformed theology with Kotel called Orthodox. Deconstruction of Reformed Theology, two and a half hours. 
Um, you come down to here with these are the the two the, the show we did with Sam Shamoon, uh, refuting Calvinism and Tulip Part One with Sam Shamoon over on Kai's Nicaea 325 channel. Um, here's a four hour thing on Calvinism and James White that I did. Uh, here is an awesome song that you can listen to when you debate a Calvinist. And here's how you it goes. are in a cult. You are not in a church. You just play this. Yeah. Excuse me. You're you're just making an assumption. You're a goblin, a demon, a demon they do, they do. So basically, just send this to Doug Wilson, and you won. Anyway, so I mean, there's not really anything that's that uh, amazing or awesome that that makes it any different other than that. Uh, basically, James Jordan and Peter Lightheart, who are kind of the ideological forces behind Doug Wilson's thing, they started getting more into what you could call, I guess, Anglican and Orthodox theological writings and, and, and approaches about 20 years ago. And I was actually in some of those uh, circles uh, in terms of reform circles when they were going in that direction and starting to advocate for uh, pedo uh, communion and these kinds of things. And so it's uh, it's a bridge, actually. Many people go from the Doug Wilson thing to orthodoxy, or and some have gone to Rome. Um, I initially went from that stuff to Rome <clears throat> when I was 22, uh, somewhere in there. Um, but then uh, other people also have come from the Doug Wilson circles over into orthodoxy with us. Some of my old friends have. So, you know, it's kind of all over the place in terms of, I guess the weirdest thing is that uh, <clears throat> the idea that, for example, James White and uh, Doug Wilson are part of a common uh, Protestant tradition or church is uh, utterly laughable. If you go back to the historic battles between the English Calvinists and the English Royalists, and the, the Episcopalians, they were killing each other over church governance, whether it should be an Episcopacy, whether there should be infant baptism or not. Reformed Baptists copied and pasted the Westminster Confession to make up the London Baptist Confession. And so between Lutherans and Calvinists and these other people, they were killing each other over the things that now Doug Wilson and James White have just decided, oh, it really, does it matter if you uh, uh, baptize your infant? Does it matter if you commune your infant? Those are all up in the air. And we'll just make a new denomination ex post facto on our own around Doug Wilson. So it's just a man-made thing. And they're dishonest and they uh, know that it's a man-made thing. And that's why they always just resort to like these kind of lame boomer jokes that they would never have an actual public debate on this topic because I, I've asked them for a long time. And the reason I say this about them is that when I uh, emailed those guys, Doug Jones and Doug Wilson, many, many, many years ago, um, the responses I got were the most snarky boomer responses that I'll never forget uh, that to me showed me all I needed to know about this kind of a thing. And so I, I don't have much respect for those people and for what they're doing. I mean, I think that like when Doug Wilson did a presuppositional tag debate with Hitchens, he won the debate. Uh, but beyond that, I don't have anything else positive to say about Doug Wilson. Dang. Interesting. I, I, I take it you saw the two <sighs> videos he did with Cannon Wire, the Eastern Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox part one and two, where he basically just straw man the entirety of no, He's I haven't paid attention to Doug Wilson off, in 20 years. The pictures. No, I haven't paid attention to Doug Wilson in 20 years. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, go watch Doug Wilson's Boomer Music video troupe, and that should tell you enough. So. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. A Boomer Tarr. Excuse me. And there's nothing that a Calvinist wants more than to be taken with intellectual seriousness and to be, be taken uh, as some important, uh, a crucial thinker. And that's why uh, there's nothing that stings the Calvinists more than making fun of them in this way. So that's why I typically resort to that is because uh, there is no such thing as Calvinism. It's not a real thing. It's just a bunch of guys doing their own thing and dressed up in the notion of uh, elders and presbyters. And so they so much desire to be taken so seriously as these intellectual forces 
that uh, this is the only appropriate response to something like this. The ecumenical synods, yes. So the ecumenical synods are inspired and inerrant. Correct. How do you know? Because. And, uh, well, you know, one of their minions uh, mentioned me the other day, put me in one of the memes. Um, Stephen Wedgworth, who was funny well, that he, he used to have this uh, blog that nobody read. And now he has a blog that nobody reads that he tweets about, which nobody replies to. So he only gets replies when he stirs up drama or shares a meme like with me or somebody else in it. And uh, so they feed off of the opposition from Orthodox and Roman Catholic apologists. And uh, he, you go to his Twitter and he's get like no responses, no reply, one to three likes and replies until he puts up a meme of us and then he can get some, uh, some responses. But that's a dude who wears, uh, like, I don't know what the deal is with, like, the Cosby sweater and the sort of metrosexual sweater stuff that the, all these guys do. They wear these weird sweaters because I think it makes them, uh, I don't know, intellectual or look sort of like Oxford Dons or something like this. But, uh, no, these people are actually kind of just ridiculous jokes. And so that's why none of them, if you notice, how wouldn't wouldn't one of these Calvinists want to come forward and debate? Why have none of them stepped forward to debate ever? Now, they just did a, a critique stream of me on that Acosta dude stream. And I kid you not, they had set they wanted to set up a debate with me and his his friends who is a professor. This was like two years, three years ago. And so I was like, yeah, let's do it. And they did the same thing that IP and uh, Cucking Christianity did, where when I agreed to the debate, they then came back in the DMs and said, oh, actually, we've decided. That's what I'm talking about, dude. Yes, I know about Revealed. I'm talking about that guy, the Revealed Apologetics guy. Right. They came back, oh, we, we actually are not going to have a public debate with you because you're mean. So this is like, this has happened four or five times now where I agree to a debate, they say, we're not doing it because you're too mean and we're not going to platform you. And by the way, we have exploded 10 times beyond all of these goobers who acted like they would get the moral trump card by not platforming me. Now, maybe IP has a bigger channel. I don't care about that. But uh, I, I, I know Cameron has a bigger channel. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about these people like this uh, Acosta guy and... Uh, revealed whatever and i mean i don't even pay attention to these people so they're just looking for uh attention they want to get some props they they want to come on my channel but when i agreed to debate no we're not, you're, we're not gonna platform you you're mean dude don't wait why wouldn't you want to be platformed on my channel anyway the only people who want to do the debates are like the really delusional you know, kind of lunatic people who just lose their mind when you actually bring them on and let them talk. Remember the uni eight guy? Remember the, the crazed uni eight guy four years ago, Luke or whatever his name was. Remember how for a year he demanded me, let him on. And so I finally said, okay, come on, dude, say whatever you want. And he just had a meltdown over there rolling on the flopping and making monkey sounds. He just lost his mind. Carrie Miller. What's up? Carrie? Go ahead. You unmuted. Are you there? You there, dog? All right, moving on. Taffy. That's the name right there. Taffy. Gonna laugh at Taffy. Gonna laugh at Taffy. What's up, Taffy? Unmute. Come, unmute, bro. Let's get in that creator clash. Jefferson Lee was like, I'll fight you in the creator clash. Dude, you will be my ass, man. Why are you trying to fight me when everybody knows you're a freaking martial arts dude? <laughs> like, guy trains in like Brazilian jiu jitsu. You know, he's like, you know, buff dude. Come on, man. If I'm going to fight in the creator clash, which they haven't invited me. I got an email about it though, like about the thing, not inviting me, but I'm like, I want to do, fight in it. I'd love to fight Stephen Wedgworth in the creator clash. How's that? I knocked a sweater off of that little Weasley dude in his uh, 
wiry little John Lennon glasses. Are you there, Taffy? Do you want to talk or not? You have to unmute, man. Unmute, dude. All right. He ain't going to talk. Let's see who's next. Jose. That's a sexy name, Jose. Is that Mexican? Go ahead, Jose. Okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I wanted to follow up uh, on on your the Sunday live stream got cut off. And we were uh, the Father Deacon was just answering about the Trinity and about uh, how how to avoid tritheism, tri how to avoid tritheism in the Trinity. And uh, I wanted to ask if it so. Do I have this right that actually the three persons are not really independent? Because they're three persons. The three persons are separate, but they're not separate. The, they're not independent. Yeah, they're just they dwell each other. So they're not really like Christ can't. They're not off, separate. So they're, they're not separate or independent. They're just distinct. It, right. So that's why it's not tritheism because because Christ can't go somewhere and then just like leave the Father and the Holy Spirit behind, and they're like they where he goes, they go. You can't always see them. Yeah, it's called parahoresis, the, the divine indwelling. Each person fully indwells the other two without diminution, without division, or without confusion or separation. Yeah, so then that's... I don't see then how they can accuse us of having three gods then, because that's... If they're always... Like, I, I get... So the, like, the accusation they, is based on the assumption that, that distinctions entail separation or composition. Yeah. So it's just a metaphysical okay. assumption. But then when you ask them about their own system, they can't explain in their own system. For example, if you're a Muslim. Okay, well then how are there 99 names? How are there all these different uh, attributes? Anyway, good question, Jose. Let's move on to the next person here. We got Chadia again. By the way, uh, 46 people. I don't know why we got so many low number. We usually have like 100 people over here in the... Twitter spaces. So if you want to come on and chat, uh, request to speak, I'm probably going to, if we don't get more people coming into debate or chat or whatever, uh, I'll, I'll probably call it a night pretty soon. Request to speak. I give you the mic. You can make whatever arguments you want for as long as you want. Open forum. We got all these haters on Twitter. I always tell them to come, come make your argument. Come chat. Let's see what some of these, some of these haters are. Uh, no, no haters replying. So I sent messages to four different haters. Hey, come chat, come chat. None of them will. And they never do. Well, if you have a problem, like why wouldn't you just come chat about it? Come uh, make your argument, make your point. You can be reconciled. But a lot of people, I think, they just want to bitch on Twitter and uh, you know get some attention or whatever. They don't actually want to make a point or uh, get anywhere. Uh, what's up, Paisios? Hey, Jay, can you hear me? Yeah, what's up, man? Hey, um, I just want to ask you real quick. I, I know you talked about it. I heard you talk about it previously, but uh, I'm currently in a sort of political slash history class right now about history of American conservatism, but mainly from like the libertarian perspective. And in my book, it actually talks really briefly about like libertarian arguments from the Bible against like anti-authority and stuff. And I just want to ask if you could really go back over your refutation of that protestant eisegesis of like first samuel that tries to argue against monarchy and stuff yeah so we had a guy in here actually earlier who brought up this point and uh, just to run through the arguments really quickly i would say first of all <clears throat> um my godfather dean has a really good essay called on christian monarchy at uh soul of the east which goes through a lot of this argumentation in a really good kind of one essay form but First of all, Genesis 49, uh, in the Messianic prediction of Genesis 49, says the, that there will be a royal house of David. So the beginning of the Messianic prophecies in Genesis already predicts a royal house, a royal lineage. So we know that there's nothing inherently antithetical to God's rule with monarchy because it's a prediction of monarchy and the Davidic monarchy in Genesis 49, which, of course, Jesus fulfills by being that Davidic monarch because it says... The scepter will not depart from Judah until Shiloh cometh, and to him the nations will look. That's the prediction of Christ 
uh, being the, the, the birth of Messiah, one of the signs of the birth of Messiah is the departure of the Davidic, the, the end of the Davidic kingdom. That happens in the first century when the destruction of the temple and the, the diaspora. That's the period in which the Messiah comes, in our view. <clears throat> and so when we come to texts like Judges, which in that period, typically someone might say, oh, well, this is an anti, uh, uh, it's a period of Judges. God raised up Judges. Judges says that there was no king in Israel in those days and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. I think that that means Judges is a pro-monarchy text. Because the whole point of the relativism in, in the time of Judges is, is because of the fact that <clears throat> there was no king. When you get, this is overlooked too, even though one of the objectors tonight <clears throat> actually did mention it. In Deuteronomy, there's the law of kings. So the law of kings in the book of Deuteronomy shows that there's an anticipa anticipation and an understanding that there would be kings. So there's nothing inherently bad about kings. When it comes up in Samuel, what the people request is we don't want God as our monarch and we want a king like the nations around us. So they want a pagan conception of a king and a monarch and they specifically don't want God as king. So God concedes to this and says, all right, I will concede to you, but I will show you also how bad this will be because their motivations were bad. So the problem wasn't monarchy itself. The problem was the Israelites bad motivations for it. When you get to the Proverbs, there are tons of Proverbs that are pro-monarchy, pro-aristocracy, pro-nobility, pro-hierarchy. People forget this as well, but there's tons of these. How could, if the Old Testament, the Bible was a anti-monarchical treatise, why would there be so many Proverbs about the good of the king, the good of the nobility? That's all through the Proverbs. When we get to the New Testament, there's these statements about obey the king. Well, that's a monarchical text. Paul says that even though uh, Caesar was a pagan, he's still there by, by divine providence. And so when we get to the period of the church and the church fathers, by the time of the 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th ecumenical councils, the church has already pretty much adopted and given a blessing to monarchy and imperium. In the 7th council, they call it the God-ordained imperium or something, some phraseology like that. And that's why Father Seraphim Rose says in uh, nihilism that uh, imperium and monarchy are the only forms of, of, of governance that providentially the church has blessed. That's why the church has a coronation ceremony, which is almost a quasi uh, mm, uh, sacramental service. By the way, I so young Don did a stream to those in the chat. They're talking about him, uh, about me, and I reached out and said, "Let's ch let's chat. Let's have a conversation. Let's talk." And he just like replied to the uh, video that I did. I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying it was B for drama. I just kept saying, "Let's have a conversation." So I again, all the people that you guys say I should talk to. We always reach out and offer and try to talk to these people. So, yeah, I've tried to talk to Sneeko, tried to talk to Young Donna. Any, and any of those people are welcome to come and have a conversation or debate or whatever they want. So we're still trying to set up the debate with uh, Bryson. I don't know if he's going to do it, but we're still trying. Anyway, sorry, uh, Paisios, but that, that's what I would say in kind of a quick rundown as to my reply about the, the, the statement in Samuel. Yeah, that, that seems that seems pretty sufficient. It just it's just a complete eye to Jesus. But um, it kind of what you said kind of correlates with what my bishop said is that um, is that um, he would argue while it wasn't like a perfect institution since it's like not here anymore, but that monarchy itself, like Christian specifically Christian imperial monarchy, Orthodox imperial monarchy, was the best possible form of government right. that ever existed on earth yeah so and that, absolutely no saints in the history of the church say anything positive about republic or democracy many 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 saints say positively how good orthodox monarchy is so uh saint john of kronstadt there you go yeah the only people who say that within orthodoxy is scholars who are getting funding from heterodox sources so yeah just follow the money yep. when you see an orthodox person advocating for democracy yeah and they're almost always advocating for all the other problems too exactly also real quick yeah, i sure. wanted to point out when someone said um St. John Chrysostom never actually criticized the papacy. I've actually researched where it said that it's actually not true. St. John was, was the one that actually had to correct the papacy on the Miletian schism. Because, you know, the papacy, Rome was on the wrong side of the Miletian right. schism for decades. And it, it wasn't until St. John sent letters to 
either Pope Damas or Pope Innocent laying out the case that um, Polinius was never the true patriarch of Antioch, that it was Miletius. That's a great point. Yeah, I, I didn't actually know that uh, uh, Chrysostom said that, but I do know, and I have covered uh, Basil's letters, he castigates Rome as worthless, useless, and all of that as well. So in the very same time, the Miletian Schism, uh, Basil uh, calls out and says that Rome, not only was Rome unable to solve the schism, they actually made it worse and were on the wrong side. And uh, ba uh, the Roman Catholics never talk about this. They don't, they just ignore this. I've been talking about this for years. Go watch my podcast where I go through Basil's letters because they, these are all, this is like three or four years ago. These are all great proofs against the Vatican I claims of the papacy. Just, just go watch my podcast on how did, there's nothing in any of this in Basil's attitude towards this whole controversy that is anything close to papism in Vatican I. It's the exact opposite. On the Miletian schism. The entire Cappadocians, for that matter, because Miletius, you know, presided over Constantinople, Constantinople and he was exactly. supported by both Gregories there. Right. And that's the council that confirms the Trinity. Pretty important. So the doctrine of the Trinity, confirmed at the Second Ecumenical Council, called outside of communion with Rome, closed outside of communion with Rome, presided over by St. Melodius, who dies outside of communion with Rome, retroactive or post ex post facto, after the time of uh, Pope St. Leo, Rome says, okay, yeah, we do uh, retroactively accept the Second Council now. Oh, so being called outside of communion with Rome, dying outside of communion with Rome, confirming a council on the most important doctrine of all of theological doctrines, the Trinity, happens outside of communion with Rome. That is a tremendous proof against papism in Vatican I. And the Roman Catholics never talk about that. They don't care. Chadia, last one, what's up? Nobody else is last one. Hello? Yo, what's up? Hey, uh, finally got this crap figured out. Um, yeah, I had a kind of specific question, but before I wanted to maybe you get a clarification on what pr precisely you mean when you describe, uh, or when you would use the, the term uh, divine revelation, like what do you mean when you say that? So for us as Orthodox, divine revelation is the entire content of God's self-disclosure of himself to the patriarchs, the prophets, and the apostles. So it's the entire body of the teaching, the deposit of faith, handed down to those people and preserved in the church. And so part of that is the scriptures, part of that is the tradition of the church, the lives of the saints, the experience, and so forth. So that's what we mean by divine revelation. It's God's self-disclosure of himself in Christian theology. Okay, and what uh, what does the process look like to determine if something goes in the divine revelation bin, if you will? Like, how do you know this uh, you know this event or this thing that somebody experienced um, or perceived themselves to experience? How what's the you know how do you determine that that goes into the you know bin of divine revelation right so, so or something else so the first the the primary starting point is the scriptures uh most of the church fathers in the councils do talk about the scriptures having a primacy of place but then there's also other elements that are just as important like the divine liturgy the apostles established liturgical worship um so in other words there's not actually one uh list of the things that is uh, you know protestants and roman catholics are usually just like where's the list of the things there's a lot of things right. Um, and so the way that we know that some person's experience is valid, for example, some saint, is that it would be in concert with all of the other saints, all the other teachings of the church fathers, all the other teachings of the councils and the scriptures. So it's, it's a holistic thing. There's not one simple single thing that anybody can point to because it, just, it doesn't really work like that. So how do we know? Well, it would be in, in, in continuity with the rest of the teachings of the church and the scriptures and the councils, uh, and it would be done under the guidance of the spiritual father, and it would ultimately be received by the church. So there is a reception element too. So the church knows okay. her own, and so nobody's going to you know, have crazy... Let's say somebody says, oh, God's talking to me, and I, uh, uh, it's God because he's telling me to get rid of uh, the writings of Paul. 
uh, and I'm, I'm uh, appointed by the Holy Spirit to get rid of the writings of Paul. Well, we would know that that's not in accord with private or previous revelation. So we would know that that's not God speaking to that person. And I mean, this is like a lot of cults do this, right? Right. So I guess what I was thinking of more, um, maybe from like a, almost like an atheist perspective or maybe more of like a presuppositional oh, okay. viewpoint. Cause it's sort of, you know, like let's go all the way back to, you know, what Moses recorded in Genesis. How do we know that is divine revelation? You know, how do I you like, saying, yeah. whenever you're refuting a Protestant and they'll say something like, you know, scripture, uh, explain scripture well it's sort of like well hold on how do you know it's scripture to begin with so that's sort of what i'm trying to understand yeah so if it's an if it's an argument out drop of yeah. divine yeah exactly I, I, that's where tag comes in right so i'm not going to make the same argument to a person in a cult that i'm going to make to an atheist because i mean even though there, there might be some overlap like the person in a cult will usually say something like oh we like the bible but we also like this other uh, crazy book that tells you to wear magical underwear right so uh, if it's an atheist type of thing, then we're going to go back to tag and we're going to go back to precept and we're going to make the argument about the basic principles of a worldview. And that's what leads us to then seeing, well, what worldview can make sense of those uh, basic presuppositions and categories. And we would argue then that it's the Orthodox Christian worldview that gives an account for and makes sense of those things. Okay. So if I were to, you know, make a, maybe a presuppositional argument about the concept of revelation and say, you're just kind of arbitrarily believing what Moses experienced and explained in scripture to be the case. Is that just where, you know, faith, is that just sort of like the launching point? of? No, no, like no. What we, what we would say, or? no, what we would say is that, <clears throat> so if you look at the basic concepts of what makes up a worldview, this would be uh, basic principles of epistemology, ethics, and metaphysics. The Christian worldview from divine revelation actually gives a coherent metaphysic, a coherent epistemology, and a coherent ethic that makes sense of the world that works, that is epistemically justifiable. That's the argument. So the argument is not that it's just arbitrarily, because not every or any worldview or a divine revelation could fit into the box. We're saying that it's only this one because only this one actually provides that consistent metaphysic. Okay, yeah, I, I guess that's because I can pretty clearly see why the other ones obviously fail the same, you know, test. But I'm just having a hard time understanding, you know, if someone, you know, if you, without granting that, you know, the div divine revelation, like how do you even know divine revelation is a thing in the first place to then start putting things into that category? That's I what guess, the, that's the purpose of the tag argument is to show that it's a necessity for these philosophical concepts because they can't be justified or explained without God as the ultimate precondition for the transcendental categories which make experience possible. So, yeah, like without telos in the universe, then there's pretty much... So is this... is is it? I mean, I guess that sort of is what divine revelation is, is God showing us purpose in the world. Is that... Well, divine of... revelation is the body of doctrines that are the... Uh, the grounding for those things those things actually don't stand on their own they require some kind of god some kind of metaphysic to make that all work okay and so you know if someone were to say well this the whole idea so yeah if somebody just didn't believe in divine revelation or i guess rather wanted to prove that divine revelation is real or is the case you would have to then go just sort of into the tag argument into you know yeah i would say so okay so if god doesn't exist, exist and sort of saying this is the one that works and the others don't or is there some i think i'm sort of look once I, you recommended to me the bradshaw paper and as you can tell by how many times i couldn't get this to work i'm booming out here on twitter and i couldn't find well that the, doesn't uh, that doesn't bradshaw paper you wrote but, okay, but that's, that's not about tag this. That's not about tag, though. So this is a different point. The, the tag uh, paper would be the Mannion paper, not Bradshaw. So, uh, Oh, yeah, Russ Mannion, sorry. Yeah, uh, that yeah. one's a great one for introduction to tag. But, I mean, what we're saying here is, if you okay, if you don't believe in God or you don't think there's any divine revelation, now you have the, uh, the impossible task of autonomous epistemology trying to give an account for ethics, metaphysics, and epistemology. How are you going to do that? Uh, as a finite, limited in experience human mind. 
I mean, you're welcome to do it. Go for it. I mean, what is the atheist justification for those principles, which go outside of the domain of sense experience? Well, yeah, because I guess that'd be another thing is trying to understand, like when you know, when Moses had God speak to him and reveal these things to him, you know, to dis to distinguish between saying, well, that is Moses. Um, I don't know if it's a precise enough word to say his experience or his understanding or his interpretation of you know some com combination of both sense data and something spiritual you know not in the sense that like you know what you experience is one-to-one -one with you know the particles and the sense data and these things but um that you're you know the way you i don't know if you're you're consciously aware of something. There's a word that I'm completely blanking on that sort of encompasses both the spiritual reality and the physical reality in how somebody understands something. You know, how would you refute that that is just, you know, these things that Moses understood to be God telling him, you know, X, Y, Z was actually just his, um, you know, experience or his understanding or how he, perception maybe would be the word, how he perceived something happening in his life. Okay, so if uh, that's the case for Moses, then presumably that's the case for every single individual. So everything is right. purely okay. So if everything's purely relative, then you can't say anything, and then there are no truths. Right. So then I think someone would be forced to sort of go down the trail of, well, you just have to be more convincing and you know admit relativism. But is that still like a false? Okay, if you thing? admit relativism, that's self-refuting, and now you can't say anything. You can no longer make any truth claims if relativism is, is the case. So it's a defeater in the it's a like surrendering of debate. There's no more debates if relativism is true. I mean, there would still be debates, but it would just be about convincing someone that you're no. you know, because most people no, there wouldn't. Like, no. So be debate debate what you're talking about. No, like debate functions on the principle of objective logic and fallacies. So if relativism is true, there's no more logic that doesn't exist. There's no more fallacies. Okay. You need logic and fallacies to have debates. So you mean like debate is in, you know, like the formal like sense with logic and everything, not like convincing idiots that something is true. Yeah. Okay. Well, with that, I mean, maybe that's if, a, if an atheist or somebody's consistent, they would say that's really all that's happening is we're just, trying to convince because i mean okay well then he can't even can't say even that because that's you know, what you're talking about so here, then he so. can't say that because he's still trying to make objective truth claims as he denies objective truth claims yeah i guess they would just be using something as a, a tool that okay well you don't get to do that the case. you don't get you don't get to just use something and contradict yourself that's that's a violation of the, the laws of debate right so i guess yeah, like you're saying, obviously, if that is your view that you can do things like this, it's it's self-contradictory um, to somebody who even isn't, isn't aware is aware. Well, that of means these we've things, won. <laughs> that means they've lost. Doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it not true. It's just a, you know, if you're kind of going down this util utilitarian type of, mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. well, these guys are stupid, and I can convince them of this, even though it's blatant. I know you know that this isn't true or real, but you know, your average. Uh, daily wire viewer or whatever isn't going to be able to put this together so i'm going to be able to you know put my will onto these people even though it's you know illogical and not consistent but 90 percent of the people out there don't even know that these things are you know That's don't true. have a clue what, what right. this stuff is yeah exactly i think that the key is that you know it's not just arbitrarily saying oh uh divine revelation therefore logic it's saying that we know that there's logic. We know that there's epistemology. We know there's metaphysical principles. How are those things? How can they be? What is the proof of those things? What is the proof of logic? What is the proof of, uh, you know, the, the universals and mathematics? How do we prove that these things are the case? Well, it's very hard to prove those things without assuming some kind of grand worldview. And what worldview can ground all those kinds of crazy things? Not all of them can because if it's just a purely relativistic one, a purely materialistic one, a purely uh, flux evolutionary one, none of those will be able to give an account for those things. And that's what we're asking for. So I think what confuses people is that it's an argument at the level of entire worldviews. 
and people just typically don't think in this way. They don't think how do, how can you make a argument for an entire worldview? Well, why not? Why can't I? I mean, I have a worldview. You have a different worldview. This other guy has a whole other world. Why can't we argue worldviews? Because ultimately, we think that's what's at war here, right? So if we're going to make the argument about the ultimate worldview level stuff, the way we're going to make that argument, the way, the way we're going to set this up to compare will, will be, okay, which of the worldviews can give an account for and make sense of the external world, logic, ethics, metaphysics, truth, numbers, rationality, uh, laws of logic, uh, human dignity, all of those things. And so were you saying earlier that this is sort of where some of the more modern philosophers kind of left the question where they just say, well, this stuff actually is all just human constructs and none of it is actually. Yeah. I mean, that's where that's basically where most philosophy has gone to. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that makes, I haven't gotten anywhere near, you know, the latest season in philosophy to know what like Kant and I don't even know if that's up to date, but that makes sense. That's where it would go. Cause that's kind of the only place you can go while being, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. somewhat consistent, but okay. And I guess, so then the, the easy way to disprove that are things like Mandelbrot sets and things that, you know, some dude sitting in his room eating mushrooms didn't just make up that it obviously exists out there in some real way. As well, I mean, Mandelbrot sets are just an example of something that, yeah, is not clearly not a uh, human mental construct. That's just one example. And there's all kinds of other things, though. But that's one easy example, exactly. Do you have maybe a, a couple other good uh, examples of things uh, that... I mean, numbers, the laws be. of logic, the external world. I mean, if you say that those things are mental constructs, then there, it, that becomes a self-defeating claim, and it destroys the possibility of knowledge at all. Okay. And like with identity over time, the sure. one of those as well. Okay. Yeah, any of the classic philosophical problems would be problems that make knowledge impossible. Absolutely. So then how do these really brilliant philosophers of like the modern time like get or you know, try to explain those categories in their system of like just said that those are like how would you they explain don't. that those things are constructs, I guess? They they don't. They've given up. They've surrendered. So they just kinda say, Well, they just Everything's say we don't know. There's no answers. Yeah, it's, just, we're done. They just say it's like an unanswerable why huh? there's numbers or something. We don't know. We'll just <clears throat> basically the approach is pragmatic. Uh, like Bertrand Russell at the beginning of Scientific Outlook says, we've never been able to solve Hume's challenges, so we're just going to forget about trying and act like uh, we'll pretend that there is an external world. Can we prove there's an external world? No. Can we prove that there is logic? No. Can we prove that numbers are objective and truthful? No. But we'll just act like they are. I'm not kidding. That's what they do. Wow. And people is don't that... be, people okay. don't understand that this is how flimsy the entire academic superstructure world is, right? They just have this faith in oh, but there's a bunch of universities and they have big buildings and they have columns and statues in front of the buildings, so they must be smart. They must have all the answers. They must no, no. It's foolishness. And is that at all tied to like skeptic like? Did those guys come out of like skepticism or something because i could see on one hand you could maybe be like you know the not the incredulity or whatever but you know we just don't know how to prove that these things exist but they do exist like like one guy you debated who was like i just you know i don't have to make a i don't know how i know i don't know i don't know if that makes sense but maybe there is there a way i mean not every not every that, you, you know, know professor know out there type of thing not every professor out there believes that i'm just speaking in generalities about the you know general atmosphere of today's modern secular academia and scholarship and particularly in uh, the domain of philosophy it's really just kind of like you know, it's now it's it's capitulated to woke stuff, dude. It's like philosophy is just, you know, uh, feminist lesbian tree ethics. <laughs> I'm not joking. It's like, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, transitioning in uh, Shakespeare. It's like that's what they do now. They don't they don't do any of this stuff that we talk about. That's that's dead and gone. They think that that's all po- pointless. Just go look at uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. When he's asked about philosophy, he just says, Oh, if a philosophy is what, worth, what, what, worthless, there's no use to philosophy. Uh, we've given up on that. Don't ask, don't ask philosophy questions. We're done, we're done with that. Yeah, because he can't answer it because of what I'm saying. And so it was like Birch and Russell and these guys, like, were they skeptics? I don't even know if that's the correct, like, school. Like, don't, is that. Uh, well, you could say that. Just... You could say that skepticism begins with David Hume and Kant. 
And so they are heirs to the skepticism of David Hume all the way up to Quine's paper on two dogmas of empiricism, basically just restating a bunch of David Hume's challenges. So, but I, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean that they would say, oh, I am a, I am a skeptic per se. It's many of them would. Uh, would Bertrand Russell say he's a skeptic? Yeah, probably. He would say, I'm an empiricist, atheist, materialist, skeptic. Sure. Um, and he would just say, we don't care about those questions. Let's just do science. Science, that's what Neil deGrasse Tyson says. He says, science doesn't care about answering why. It just studies the how. Okay, but then how is science going to solve civilization and man's problems when it ignores and rejects the notion of how? Because that's normativity, and uh, you can't build a civilization on just scientism, and, uh, and scientism is a new religion. That's the point. Right, and that's the whole azot anyway, even if you can prove these things to be the case. Like, who, who cares if that's the case? Well, I mean, it's ironic because Bertrand Russell is supposed to be a logician, but his logic is ultimately a situation that says that there is no grounding for logic. We'll just act like it's the case. Good questions. I'm going to move on because my uh, back's yeah, getting you. tired. Yeah. Um, last one here. We'll go to Huriska. What's up? Yo. Hey. Hey, uh, so kind of piggybacking on the last guy, there's a, there's a Joe Rogan episode where he has like this Muslim mixed martial artist dude that comes on mm -hmm. and he does a, a presuppositional critique of scientism and you can see Joe Rogan's brain just melt <laughs> and it's, it, I mean, I, I don't know. If uh, well, Joe Rogan should so. have me on to do a real presuppositional critique because I guarantee we could beat that Muslim dude. Oh yeah, 100%. And you know what? I don't even think the Muslim dude even knew he was doing that, but, <laughs> right. but he did do it. And yeah. you can literally see Joe Rogan, like his brain just melts. Like you can tell he's never been asked those questions, nor has yeah. he ever thought in right. that way before. Yeah, that's funny. I'll check that out. Guy. I'll check that out. Do you have any other questions? Oh yeah. So, um, I, I had a question about, um, uh, sinful nature, uh, in humans. So, um, I'm coming from a Protestant, uh, reformed kind of paradigm. I'm making my way out of that. So I was just wondering, um, how far is that from the Eastern Orthodox understanding? It's very far. That. Yeah. It's, this is a, uh, first one of the first things that you need to get out of your head is the idea that natures are evil. So God is the creator of everything that exists natures exist essences exist god gives those essences being sin and evil do not have being they are not things they are privations and they are moves of the will away from the good they are not a state there's no such thing as a state of sin or a state of being that is evil this is patristics 101 patristic metaphysics 101 and so it's never correct to say that there is a sinful nature per se nature is good sin is an act of the will against the good or against the divine law john if you read the book of james james says that that desires themselves are not sin but when they're consented to by the will they become sin and give birth to death so the desires are not sin i saw doug wilson the other day saying that concupiscence is sin that's a stupid calvinist position no the desires themselves are not sin sin is an act of the will so when you consent to the violation of the divine law that is a sin natures don't sin persons sin when they act by will against the divine law so there's no such thing as a state of sin when we talk about the state of corruption that we inherit from adam that is the deprivation of grace that we inherit as a consequence of adam's sin not the guilt of adam's sin and not adam's personal sin so that's the distinction that's why mary in orthodox theology is sinless but she has the consequences of Adam's sin. So Mary proves the distinction between Adam's sin and the guilt of Adam's sin. Adam has guilt for Adam's sin. We have the effects of Adam's sin. We don't have the guilt of Adam's sin. I have guilt when I commit personal actual sin. Okay. And that is Orthodox cool. Theology 101 and all the 20 year olds on Twitter that don't know this are just simply wrong and don't know what they're talking about. And they're confused over terms. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to have to look into that a lot more. But yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Um 
also, uh, this is more of a experiential notion, but because I was coming out of the, the paradigm, uh, I just want to ask you, so what, because, you know, when you're sitting in a, a Protestant church or you'll hear uh, Reformed people say that uh, a baby is a viper in a diaper, kind of like these dumb little sayings, but essentially they're saying that, you know, when your baby takes stuff from you or hits you, that's the sinful nature uh you know, showing itself. So, yeah, and, <clears throat> yeah we, we inherit a corrupted, uh, uh, what's called concupiscence. But to sin requires the uh, conscious action of the will to do so. And that's why even Isaiah says, before the child knows to choose the good over the evil, that means there is an age of choice where we come to know the difference between good and evil. Yes, infants have inherited that concupiscence, but that itself is not sin. Sin is only, you're only guilty when you have committed an action that you're consciously acting against the divine will. There's no such thing as a state of sin. Because again, are we Manichaeans or are we Christians? Because it says in Genesis that God created everything good. So do you think that God created an evil nature in babies? So does God create evil? Right, right, yeah. That would that be Manichaeanism. Yeah. The Manichaeans said that there is an evil essence or nature that exists, and it's in contrary duality for all eternity uh, in a dialectical opposition to the good principle. We're not Manichaeans. When God created everything, he said it is good, even the natures that he created. Good question, okay. though. And, yeah. And uh, what's, what's the definition of concupiscence or the word that you said yeah that's the latin term for the passions so they mean the, the same when the orthodox okay. church talks about the passions that means the passions. disordered desires that we inherit as a result of the fall not all of the desires are evil or disordered for example the desires themselves are fine the sexual desire nothing wrong with the biological desire to reproduce but it becomes sin when i consent to it outside of the appropriate ways to do it that's when it's sin. So eating, there's nothing wrong with eating. It's a natural desire, but the desire to overeat and to make that into a pleasurable luxury of gluttony, that's the sin. It's the disordered desire, not the desire itself. Calvinism is predicated on saying that the desire itself is sin. So God, who gives us our desires, which are a faculty or an aspect of our nature, God gives us a sinful nature in their view when they're consistent. And Luther is even more consistent. says, absolutely. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I, I feel like you put words to things that have been in my mind and in my heart. Yeah. So people in the chat are asking about Isaiah 45. So in the Old Testament, the word evil is used in multiple senses. It doesn't always mean just uh, moral uh, <clears throat> actions against the divine law. Sometimes evil can, can be used for a uh, force of nature, a hurricane, right? <clears throat> That's right. not the same thing as me uh, committing adultery with Bathsheba, like David did or something, right? So that's a difference. But to, so when Isaiah says, I create evil, he's talking about, I bring chastisement through these kinds of natural phenomena. He's not saying that I create a substance of evil like the Manichaeans and the Gnostics said. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I feel like you're making a lot of connections for me, so it's it's a great help. And one, one last question sure. since we're on this topic. Um, so I was talking to some friends, and we were talking about mushrooms and stuff. And uh, obviously in the New Testament, it talks about uh, uh, pharmacia and witchcraft and stuff like that. So I, I was just wondering that, or it was a question that dawned on me that, well, if God created the physical world along with, you know, mushrooms and different plants that cause trans states like that, um, what would be the purpose of them in God's mind when he created them? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of things that <clears throat> have usages that can be abused. So, for example, wine, you know, it says in the Psalms, God gave wine. So there's nothing wrong with the wine itself. There's nothing wrong with uh, the usage of certain drugs in certain contexts. But I would say that the reason that psychedelics and things like this are dangerous is not because they're inherently evil or something like that, but rather that the attempt to achieve altered states <clears throat> for divine insights and for <clears throat> uh, uh, mystical experiences 
is particularly dangerous because of the propensity for delusion and for the propensity to uh, pre-lust rather than anything within the, the substances themselves. I mean, uh, you know, heroin might produce some very pleasurable experiences. <coughs> <coughs> But, uh, you know, do I want to engage in something that's going to, uh, you know, give me some horrible addiction for the rest of my life? No. So just because something exists doesn't mean that the usage of that thing is necessarily lawful. So everything has to be done in its right uh, situation with wisdom. Now, could there be usages of hallucinogens for extreme situations of people? I Possible. I'm not supporting Soros and the maps thing. And I, I, I know all about M culture. I know all about the history of all that stuff very well. Um, is, but I'm just saying, is it possible? Well, I knew a dude one time who was so severely, uh, uh addicted to alcohol that, <clears throat> uh, could he have tried some therapy? I mean, in his case, maybe because I mean, he was going to die anyway. So might as well try the most, uh, you know, intense extreme form of therapy that could be, uh, maybe in his case, but that doesn't mean I'm like an advocate of, uh, you know, everybody needs to go out and trip shrooms. I think that stuff is very dangerous and I would not recommend doing that. Um, uh, but could there be some cases? Uh, perhaps, I don't know. <clears throat> Ryan, what's up? Jay, thank you so much, man, for, uh, all that you do. I'm, uh, coming out of Protestantism for the past two years, similar to the last guy, and one thing I've noticed with the Orthodox theology and the philosophical positions is it seems like they've taken all of these seeming dialectics and reconciled them right. with a good amount of grace right. and yeah, efficiency. There's one thing, though. I've started reading the Church Fathers, and I, I admittedly haven't read that much. But what I'm curious about is kind of the way that I heard – when I first came to faith, when somebody would say that Jesus was the only way to salvation, that kind of irked me because of my Western individualism. And I feel like I'm running into that same hang up with the claim that there is only one true church. And and I think where I'm running into it is with the relationship between grace and the sacraments. So I was wondering if maybe you could elucidate on that just a little more. Uh Honestly, my throat is going out. Uh, if you go look up the video that I did uh, where Posh asked this question uh, some months ago, um, <clears throat> that answers this question in terms of uh, sacraments. So I'm just going to recommend that video. <clears throat> Not because I'm trying to dismiss you. It's just that my, my throat's going out. So it's right here. It's called J. Dyer Answers the Questions of Posh Redneck on Heterodox Sacramentology. So I would say go read that or go listen to that for a 20 minute breakdown. Um, and pretty much, pretty much every one of the live streams that we do, this question comes up. So I, I kind of have to, I'm not, I'm not knocking you. I'm just saying like we answer it all the time. So I would say, check that out. But, uh, <clears throat> great question. My uh, voice is starting to go out. I'm sorry. It's just too much, too much talking. Garrett, last one. <clears throat> before Garrett goes, uh, I got to read these super chats before I have no voice. <clears throat> Tree lack $5. Jay, my fiance is of Mexican ancestry and once has a devotion to the Virgin Guadalupe. She's open to Orthodoxy. Can she add the Virgin of Guadalupe to the icon corner? Uh, no. So we cannot put heterodox icons and non-accepted apparitions in our icon corner. I do still have my old uh, Aquinas icon. I do not reverence it, but it's over here somewhere in one of my library stacks just sitting on the shelf. Um, I keep it there just as an ideological kind of uh, uh, token of the, of the past. But it is not on my icon shelf. And so, no, we cannot put um, anything heterodox or, or like that on it. But, you know, I don't think it, you don't have to burn it, but I wouldn't put it on my icon shelf. Jedediah Marshall, $10. Thank you, Jay and Father Deacon. You both helped me through the, your talks. Uh, Jedediah Marshall again for $10. Thank you for that $20 there. Multiple, multiple super chats. Gang member, $10. Um, do you have any tips for attending the first divine liturgy? Uh, just be reverent and uh, try to pay attention and learn the etiquette. Uh, don't dress in uh, hobo gear. Uh, dress nice and just try to be as polite as you can. What are your thoughts on Mormon theology, Mormonism in general? Uh, I think it's uh, tritheism, it's uh, anthropomorphic heresy, it's Gnosticism, space opera, all in one. Uh, have you done any talks that you could point me to? Uh, not so much on Mormonism. <clears throat> um, trying to think of anything that would be close to Mormonism.
No, it's one of the uh, modern kind of cults, uh, aberrant movements that we haven't really focused on because I haven't really come in contact with many <clears throat> Mormons. Uh, a few people here and there pop up asking questions, but uh, it's just not something that's really popped up a whole lot. So uh, maybe in the future we should do a Mormon deep dive. Jboy, $3. <laughs> Your old video on metaphysics with Pharrell. Guy could harness frequency to split Earth. Yeah, he had a theory about CERN. I looked up the opposite side of Earth from CERN. 30 miles from a place called Chatham Islands. Is it a coincidence? I don't know. I, have, I don't have any knowledge of CERN. It was just kind of... Uh, he was many years ago speculating on what it might really be. If it's not a, you know, scientism project like they say. <clears throat> Catherine Austin, Austin, Austin Fitz hypothesized Mr. Global lives in Australia. I assume that's what you mean by AU. Um, I don't know. I need to know more about that to comment on that. Um, anyway, thank you guys so much. I think uh, next up we'll have a, an interview with Rachel tomorrow. Is that tomorrow night? Yeah, so we'll be talking about her book on uh, occult feminism. And I'll be on uh, tomorrow again, guys, with um, Sean uh, Atwood. Uh, Atwood. Uh, our podcast last week got a lot of views, 130, 40,000 views on uh, uh, Klaus and the History of the World Economic Forum. And so we'll be back tomorrow on Sean's channel talking about similar stuff. And then, um, yeah. So thank you guys so much. A lot of fun tonight, a lot of wild. All, we were all over the place. It's always a challenge to, to title these. Uh, did your five? I don't. If, if I missed somebody super chat, I'm sorry. Um, last one I see was J Boy, Jedediah gang member. That's all I see. So, if you missed it, try again. THC. No, Sean Atwood. I was just on Sean Atwood's show last week. So anyway, four hours again, guys. Like and share. Support the show. Sign up for Rockfin. Can't forget to promote Rockfin. That's our. Uh, Famous, awesome, based, uh, free speech-based platform. Uh, also, you can uh, get access to my archives. Good news, guys. This week, I will, I'm will i back from all the traveling from TimCast and all that from Nashville. Got to meet Burma. So I got to meet Dr. Peter McCullough uh, in Nashville a couple days ago. Uh, I should have got a picture with him. I didn't think to. When I walked in the building, I saw Burma, and it was like, hey, hey. And then he's like, hey, here's Dr. Peter McCullough. So I met him, and... Um, we did some uh, podcasts and interviews there at the media room at that big event. So that was fun. Um, me and Burma, so I didn't get, I didn't really get to talk for very long to Peter McCall. I just got to me meet him. But if you guys would hit like and share on that, uh, on this, and then uh, go to Rockfin, subscribe to Rockfin. A lot of great content over there. It's our, it's one of our, uh, you know, best supporters and sponsors as well as Chalk, as well as uh, Richard Grove. <clears throat> So shout out to all the sponsors. And guys, if you would like and share not just this, but the Tim Cash show, we need to get get the views going on that, get those views up, then they're much more likely to invite me back. So it's great that everybody's in the comments saying have me back, but uh, get the views up. So share that across the board. And everybody, thank you so much for the Super Chats. And uh, subscribe, by the way, to get access to the uh, archives. I will have the next part two lecture of the the Milner Fabian book up this week. So I know we're a little bit behind on that for subscribers. Um, Amir Khan, $5. Yes, I answered that question earlier that you asked about uh, sexual